A job well done, General Skywalker. I wish more Jedi had your military sensibilities. That he and Vader were kindred spirits suggested that both of them might be Sith. Tarkin often wondered if that wasn't the actual reason Palpatine had been targeted for arrest or assassination by the Jedi. Don't underestimate the Force. The Jedi are extinct. Their fire has gone out of the universe. You, my friend, are all that's left of their religion. What's up, Meta Nerds? In this multi-part series, we'll cover the complete life of Will of Tarkin, in canon, putting every source from comics, novels, games, shows, and movies in chronological order, taking us from his birth in one of the galaxy's most renowned military families, his rise through the Republic, how he came to loathe the Jedi Order, and become Palpatine's most respected advisor, taking command of the most sensitive and important projects for the secret Sith's rule. Tarkin's story begins in the year 64 BBY, on the planet Eriadu, located in the Seswana sector of the Outer Rim. The home Willif would have been born into is just one mansion in a collection of impressive structures that formed the walled-off Tarkin compound, a compound that protected the extended Tarkin family of uncles and cousins from the dangerous and dirty plebs. Much like how the upper level of Coruscant was built literally on the lower, darker, and deadlier levels of the capital, being an Outer Rim world, Eriadu was no serene Naboo. Instead, it was filled with countless deadly beasts and for thousands of years had been a hub of pirate activity and native warring tribes. This would all change with the apparent total defeat of the Sith in 1000 BBY. Without the powerful Dark Side Empire to contend with, the Republic voted to disband their military completely and work to incorporate more worlds into the Republic. The first Tarkin to ever arrive on Eriadu was one of millions of pioneers that spread out from the Core Worlds. Knowing that best scenario back home was to grind away trying to move your family from slightly less dangerous and dank apartment to the next, being one of the billions stuck in poverty on Coruscant, or you could hope to live like a king on these untamed worlds. The Republic encouraged this pioneer movement, as there were thousands of worlds without any native populations, and many others that would peacefully enter into trade agreements. But there were rumors that some pioneers had took their worlds by force, enticed by the credits that would start flowing when Mining Vein and Hyperspace Lane could be joined. It was a scenario played out in many remote regions, and in Iriadu's case, the resource happened to be Lomite Ore. Lacking funds to mine, process, and ship the crude, Iriadu settlers had been forced to secure high-interest loans from the intergalactic banking clan. But in an era when hyperspace travel between the Seswena and the core required astrogating by hyperwave beacons, with numerous reversions to real space necessary to ensure safe passage, shipments of ore were frequently delayed or lost due to one catastrophe or another. The Munes were essential to the development and expansion of the Republic, but the pioneers footed the bill and risked their lives, all while a neutered Republic did nothing to stop the pirates or regional warlords that were springing up. Since the banking clan held all the loans for the mining operations, housing, and infrastructure, they could foreclose on entire worlds, with tears of rage and defeat welling up in the once bright eyes of pioneers, unable to secure profits to pay off their loans due to all the crime in the area. The Munes had successfully foreclosed on entire planets numerous times, adding to their own sort of financial empire. But just then, an apparent rescuer appeared in the form of investors from the core world Coralag. They were able to buy up the debt, and thus get the settlers some more time, and use their political influence on Coruscant to get the Senate to approve the creation of the Hydean Way, putting Eriadu on a major hyperspace lane. Though this was not charity. Eriadu simply had a new master, and established a constant supply of cheap laborers from nearby poorer worlds. The Tarkins saw that their dream was just that, and in reality, no matter where they went, the powers of the core worlds would catch up to them. So instead of fighting against it, they found a way to thrive within this system. As loans go, blasters and bombs had a great return on investment, and they would set up a security and defense force on Eriadu. When new cities and mining operations were established in the wilderness, Tarkin security would protect the site from predators, both ferocious beasts and blaster-wielding thieves, which were always lurking in the shadows. Unwilling to join the wretched thralls of these immigrant worker communities, which were springing up all over the planet, a mirroring of the lower levels of Coruscant, Tarkins would identify the best and brightest among them and train them in local militias, eventually growing them to protect the whole of Eriadu and eventually the entire Seswana sector. 
willing it into the Tarkin DNA that dreams and virtue would not protect you in life. One needed to have a keen mind to identify the immovable leadership, find a way to serve that leadership as a way of keeping yourself out of the cesspool which all others were doomed to drown in. Though the loans were tough, it was the crime that led to the failure of so many pioneers, a point which would stick with the Tarkins forever. Disorder was a threat to all success in civilization, even nature itself, as Ariadu was no idyllic beauty before the bankers and miners arrived, it was a jungle filled with horrid creatures that saw you as only food, just like the thugs that would snuff you out for a single credit. And they also understood that it was the technologically superior weapons in the hands of Tarkin security that finally set them free. Technology in the form of colossal machines, swift starships, and potent weapons had helped convert the hunted into the hunters. And it would be technology that would one day usher the planet into the elite of the modern galaxy. Over the centuries, the powerful mining, trade, and military families cemented into a sort of nobility on Ariadu. Though the core world nobles always looked down on them, seen as outer rim pretenders that could never just get the etiquette right. Their mansions were seen as just gaudy imitations of the palaces on Coruscant. The Tarkins were not delicate and aloof enough to truly fit in with the Blue Bloods. They weren't enough generations away from their roots, they still had the stench of physical labor and bloody combat. Tarkin understood this at an early age, particularly when dignitaries from the core visited and made his parents feel smaller than he knew them to be, whose rough cities lacked weather control and opera houses, and whose residents were still battling pirates and rapacious nature for supremacy. And yet he felt no need to search outside his own family for childhood heroes, since it was his ancestors who had fought back the wilderness, survived the odds, and brought order and progress to the Seswena. Young Willif donned the finest robes and slept in a mansion that was the envy of all on Ariadu, but his family knew that they did not matter at all to those who truly mattered and father and mother would take every opportunity they could to make sure their boy understood that success required constant vigilance, and yet defeat could come at any moment. During one notable dinner, his father had the servant rip the plate out from under Willif's nose before he could even take a bite, saying, quote, You see how easy it is to go from having everything to having nothing? His mother adding, How would you fare if we now banished you to the city streets? While his father was the strict military disciplinarian, his mother was just as cutthroat and intelligent. Going on, she asked, What would you do to survive? Could you bring yourself to wield a club, a knife, a blaster, if weapons were what it took to keep you from starving? This was the night that his parents would finally tell him about a ritual that had taken on an air of myth in the mind of the boy, something called the carrion, which was only hinted at a handful of times in his ten years of life. This was a rite of passage. As his mother said, only certain Tarkin males would undergo the carrion, and his father said that it was necessary to quote, know if you are simply ordinary or larger than life. When Tarkin asked if his family was different from their near human species servant, if Noma had ever went through this ritual, his father exploded up out of his seat and yelled, who serves whom? Have you ever placed a meal in front of Noma? And when young Willif said that he would, his mother's face seemed to harden to stone, letting out a harsh, not in this house. After seeing the boy shrinking into his seat, father assured him that when he completed the carrion, he would understand how to make Noma content with his station. And just days after his 11th birthday, a trio of hooded figures burst into the marble-filled dining room. Covered in dirt and leaving a thick trail of mud everywhere they stepped, they snatched food off the table as they approached the boy. But Willif knew by his parents' reactions that these men were here to bring him to the much-anticipated ritual. He hurried up the steps to gather his things, and the leader laughed at the sight, his father stepping forward to introduce the man as Willif's grand-uncle, Jova. His parents offered no words of encouragement or embrace, simply watching with gloomy faces as he climbed into the speeder. This trip was a long and meandering journey through the countryside, mountains, rivers, and hills that became increasingly more untamed. He couldn't believe he was on the same world, having only ever seen the safe, manicured parts of the city. Even at just 11 years old, it hit him that this is what his father had warned of. These thickets of thorns and poisonous plants, all living proof that the natural state of affairs was pointless and deadly chaos. Savagery was being held back by the sentient beings with an iron will. Thousands of square miles of untouched Ariadu was preserved by the now 20 generations of Tarkins, 
The first wild animal he had ever set eyes on would be shot by the hunting party, and Willif was given a vibroblade to cut it from groin to throat, blood spurting, hitting him in the face, and drenching his tidy uniform before Great Uncle Jova told him to shove his hand up there and pull out the liver. And with some difficult pulling, it was set free, and Jova took it from the boy to split it up with the elder hunters, but left the biggest piece for Willif. This was just the first day of what would be more than a month in the wild, evading the predators that came in all forms of felines, crustaceans, and primates, while working to steal their kills. All with glimpses of some long-lost primitive native population, strange stone structures and paintings from some sentient people which had not been strong enough, a people that had found themselves in the jaws of some greater beast long, long ago. Willif was understanding the hardness that one needed to survive and protect his society from nature, but he was still confused about his father saying that it would help him to keep the servants in their station, that they would even appreciate their place until it finally clicked after a series of thefts, the group using vibro lances to scare off the predators from their kill, that Jova turned to him and said, We are teaching them how to behave in the presence of their betters. The ones who learn profit from the laws we lay down. The rest die. A few more months would go by, his uniform was now in tatters, and he was no longer shocked by the bile and blood on the hunt. He saw that even water would be stolen by the sun. Blood was his daily drink, often mixed with mind-altering plants. While his nights were spent on guard against the beings that lurked in the darkness just outside of their warm campfire. Those predators that jealously watched as their betters feasted on their stolen meals. And sometimes these sentients would lose their battle with nature. Jova's cousin was killed by a poisonous reptile, while Willif had sprung out of bed to see his lip and fingers were being devoured by an arachnid, and once he nearly died of some illness. As the seasons came to an end, Jova explained that by keeping in touch with the true nature of reality, the Tarkins have continued to rise to galactic renown. That quote, firepower and laws will keep the lessers in their place. But everything from the microscopic virus, the small spiders, up to the razor-clawed felines will constantly be trying to bring him down. The Tarkin descendants realized that this cosmic jungle, the political landscape, was no different. It emerged from nature and was just as natural, and the ruggedness that the soft core worlders sensed in the Tarkins was no flaw, no accident. It was imprinted in them through the carrion, and would prove to be their key to continued prosperity. These lessons would be deepened each summer for the next five years, as he was thrust back in time to the life of primitives surrounded by deadly chaos, all coming to an end on an area of land called the Carrion Spike. At 16 years old, Willif would be sent into the tall grass and ambushed by a pair of feline predators. The boy and the beasts were covered in each other's blood, a spear and claw ripped through flesh, but he would survive the ordeal and prove to his father to be no ordinary man. He was indeed a Tarkin. And now would begin his military career. Less than six months after the ritual completion on the Carrion Spike, his parents had arranged an elite team of space combat instructors, including Tarkin family members, some Bothans and Twi'leks, to get him ready for the next step in his journey. Great Uncle Jova would sometimes accompany him, having to take anti-nausea medicine just to tolerate space. But he wanted to make sure that Willif remembered that the terrain and predators would change, but never the laws of nature. At one point reminding him that over the millennia of Tarkins on Ariadu, more than 50 of them had been killed by pirates, and that the number of Ariaduans was too high to count. His first stop would be to a colony world that had just been raided. Thousands of colonists were killed. The ones slain by blasters or burned were the lucky ones, as the pirates seemed to enjoy the slaughter. This 16-year-old Willif saw that many of them were tortured and cut into pieces, while records pointed to hundreds of them being captured, likely to be sold off as slaves. Tarkin had never felt such a deep moral outrage, remembering that it sickened him both physically and spiritually, and Jova made sure to drive the point that this was what lawlessness looks like. And just like with the hunt on the carrion, young Tarkin was able to overcome his fear and pass his tests in space. They hunted down this group of pirates, and combined sheer will with superior technology to destroy these embodiments of chaos. When he reached the age of 18, he was proudly accepted into the Outland Security Forces. Remember, this past thousand years was heralded as the greatest time of peace in galactic history. Politicians and the Jedi Order patted themselves on the back, pointing to this as proof that standing militaries were a thing of the barbaric past. 
while those in the Outer Rim saw whole colonies being tortured, slaughtered, and left flooded in blood. The Tarkin family's security operation had grown in the Greater Sesuana, and with some additional Core World loans, the Outland security forces became one of the largest military forces in the galaxy at this time, led by Willow's cousin, Ranolf Tarkin. But even the OSF was not large enough to keep away all the vermin of the Outer Rim, especially not when the Ka'ana Marauders organized. They were led by a human female named Ka'ana, who was a PR master, branding her group of pirates as folk heroes just helping the poor. OSF intel would reveal that she was herself a rich girl from the core who had fallen in love with a noble core world kid who lived a double life. Stuffy noble by day, exciting pirate by night. When he was captured and executed, she vowed to raise the largest pirate force the galaxy had ever seen. But even the Tarkins had to respect her perseverance, as she had been picked up in the core several times by Republic judicial forces, but each time she would find a way to break free, either using her clever mind, or resorting to things like chewing off her hand, or cutting her leg off from the knee down on separate occasions to escape. And combat wounds would force other prosthetics and even an ocular implant. She built this group up to have frigates and corvettes, and though the OSF had capital ships at their disposal, the problem was nobody could anticipate their next strike. Willif had risen to the rank of lieutenant in the Anti-Piracy Task Force, and disagreed with his superior's conclusion that the pirates must have been striking at random, in part concluded by the fact that only certain ships or containers in a convoy would be hit each run, like it was run through a random number generator, as one time it might be the lead ship, then the fifth ship, or the second from last. Tarkin obsessed over these numbers knowing there must be some pattern, and by cross-referencing it with numerology from various cultures across the stars, he realized that the numbers matched to a complex calendar date of an ancient holy day for the Asmeru people. He learned that a tactician's logic had to account for the superstitions of the enemy, and he realized that this worked as her sort of lucky number, when further digging showed that the rich girl turned pirate had once lived with her family on Esmeru, Ranolf Tarkin was convinced that his cousin was not going mad, and believed that they could predict the next attack. Convincing Ariadu Mining to have a decoy ship in that numerical position installed with a virus in their Nava computer. After some time, the pirates did strike, and when they connected the ship to their own Nava computer to jump to hyperspace, they popped out of real space in the middle of the OSF fleet, who promptly disabled them and boarded. The Pirate Queen was defiant to the end, and scoffed when she saw the 18-year-old, as she put it, a whiskerless boy who was looking down his nose at her. There isn't a prison that can contain me, boy. Even on Iriadu. Wilhuff offered the sly smile that would later become a kind of signature. You're confusing Iriadu with worlds that have noble houses and trials by jury, Ka'ana. And when she resigned to execution on the spot, he explained that it would not be that simple. The OSF suspected that her noble core family had been partly responsible for her incredible ability to avoid incarceration and beat any jury. And with the words of the Tarkin patriarchs in his mind, he knew this was the time to strike fear into all those that opposed law and order. All of the pirates were packed back into the decoy container ship, and the sublight engines were set on a course for a nearby star. Using the pirate ship, they broadcasted a live feed from within the containers across the entire pirate network. Some were foolish enough to attempt a rescue, only to be blown to pieces by the OSF fleet, while the rest of the criminal world watched as their folk hero and her entire crew were slowly cooked to death. Her hard, fearless facade melting away at the very end, as her followers heard her tortured screams in the final minutes. Tarkin remembered the teaching from Jova. In the end, you will have driven the fear of you so deeply into them that fear alone will have them cowering at your feet. Wolof was becoming a legend within the OSF before he had even celebrated his 20th birthday. He would go on to design some new ships and soak up as much military wisdom as possible. But by 44 BBY, Ranolf Tarkin would be dead. The details lost to legends. Those on Ariadu saw Ranolf as the man who used the OSF to save the Republic from multiple threats over the decades. He used a military force, which was hypocritically deemed as too savage for such a peaceful era. The Tarkin family knew that true political power would never come from success in the Outer Rim security forces. And since Willif was so successful at such a young age, he moved on to enter the Sulla Sector Spacefarers Academy, the first step to transitioning to the Republic's judicial forces. 
It was not a coincidence that a young Naboo senator named Sheev Palpatine would make a point of introducing himself to the new cadet. Palpatine was there along with his friend Finis Valorum as a part of then Supreme Chancellor Kalpana's party. Ostensibly, the visit was to attend the commissioning day ceremonies, but the Naboo senator knew of the Outer Rim hero. Similarly considered to be an outsider to the true core world nobility, this Ariaduin who knew how to wield fear as a weapon and who worshipped order like a god. Cadet Tarkin, I'm Senator Palpatine. I know who you are, Tarkin said, shaking hands with him. You represent Naboo in the Senate. Your homeworld and mine are practically galactic neighbors. I want to thank you personally for the position you took in the Senate on the bill that will encourage policing of the free trade zones. The Jedi haven't provided any support in dealing with the pirates that continue to plague the Seswena. They've ignored our requests for intervention. Apparently, the Seswena doesn't rate highly enough on their list of priorities. Getting to complaints about the Jedi so quickly gave each other mutual assurance that they were not naive fools impressed with the Force wielder's sense of pomp and self-importance. Tarkin would go on to explain that if pirates could be defeated in the Outer Rim, this would help communities down the entire Hydean Way. And the Senator says Tarkin's combination of talents and understanding how the galaxy actually works convinced him and his friends on Coruscant to aid him in a career as a politician. Tarkin is taken aback by this offer. He had thought of nothing else except a military career, and was even more stunned to hear that his name was being talked about in circles of politicians in the upper levels of Coruscant. Palpatine assured him that his circle could guide Tarkin into this new life. They needed more military-minded politicians, and pulled on their shared roots, saying, I understand what it's like to be a young man of action and obvious ambition who feels that he has been marginalized by the circumstances of his birth. The fact that you weren't born closer to the core, and so you are forced to defend against their petty prejudices, that you lack refinement, culture, a sense of propriety. Despite this plea, Tarkin would continue on his path in the Judicial Academy for several years, unaware that this was a test by Palpatine to see if Tarkin did secretly yearn to be a politician. Palpatine wanted to be certain that Tarkin was focused on becoming a great military man. Tarkin would arrive at the Judicial Academy in full Outlander Commander Regalia, upon their most gleaming and beautiful warship, which taught him his first bitter lesson. All this did was to poke at the insecurities of the academic warriors, who knew that this young man had more combat experience than almost all of them, and his classmates would harass him with the facetious nickname Commander and insulting salutes as they passed by. He would get into constant brawls, winning each of them until the sheer numbers got the best of him, and his instructors made sure to keep this problematic student in the bottom of the class. Tarkin would later remember the intense confusion and disgust at the concept that a so-called military academy would punish self-defense, and mused that this should have been a sign of the Republic's pathetic response to the Separatist threat. He decided to bide his time as unprovoked as possible, and finally he would get his first assignment alongside Jedi. Tarkin was not interested in the Force, but rather how they responded to threats. Eight Judicials were paired with Knights and Masters to rescue hostages on the planet Halcyon, and on the trip he would study their saber training, noting that they each seemed to fight with different styles, but not particular to any species or blade color. This mission would see Jedi dropping the Judicial forces far from the action of the capital, and within minutes the insurgents disabled all satellites and scrambled all of the comm systems. The commander of Tarkin's group was in a panic, but the hero of the Seswana organized the men and showed them a path through the wilderness. It would be more than a week of trekking across the mountainous terrain, living off the land, and relying on the experiences of the Carrion to save his men. And to show the lessons he learned in the academy, not to outshine the master, he let the commander retake lead of the men as they finally approached the city fortress, Jedi shocked that their group had survived. Most of the other Judicials were hesitant to admit that the Outsider had saved them, but the story did slowly get around. The nickname Commander was no longer a mocking one, and there was now an ever-growing base of other Judicials that saw Tarkin as a natural-born leader, destined for greatness. Over the course of several more missions, he would gain greater leadership roles, but there was always the nagging intrusion of politics. In the mid-30s BBY, there were now dozens of systems floating the idea of secession from the Republic, basing their complaints on the corruption that the early Tarkin settlers experienced a millennia earlier, and to which Willif was still navigating today. 
Despite this, Tarkin knew their solution would plunge the galaxy into chaos, resulting in even more suffering, and saw the so-called Republic reformists as merely useful idiots for the agents of anarchy. Some of his fellow cadets had joined the planetary militaries of groups that were called the Separatists, and he worried his Outer Rim world would be drawn into this chaos as well. Senator Palpatine would continue to push his offer, knowing that he could trust a man that had to be pressured into becoming a politician. And within a short time, the hero of the OSF and rising cadet of the Republic Judicial Forces was now the governor of Ariadu. In the year 33 BBY, Darth Sidious would pull the strings to have a trade summit that was set to put an end to the tensions between the Separatists and Republic held on Ariadu. It would be deemed the Ariadu Conference and have several dignitaries including Supreme Chancellor Finis Valorum, the directors of the Trade Federation, and executives from Kuwa. All were certain that the OSF working with the Judicial Forces and Jedi Order would be able to provide security for the meeting. But a terrorist group called the Nebula Front were able to do the impossible. They were able to infiltrate the room and launch an attack that killed the entire ruling body of the Trade Federation and the Kuwati execs, but failed to get their main target, the Chancellor. With this single attack, Darth Sidious had secretly moved the pawns into place for a coming war. Kuat was now passionately against the secessionists, promising the full power of Kuat drive yards to secure peace. Tarkin was personally insulted by this failure on his homeworld, burning with rage to destroy all associated with anti-Republic sentiment, and Sidious's pawns Nuke Gunray and Lot Dodd had become the new leaders of the Trade Federation. While every attempt from Valorum's staff to look into the event was blocked by Governor Tarkin, hoping to make the Chancellor seem weak and open the lane for his friend Palpatine to take his place. Valorum's family was one of, if not the most blue blood core family in history, with his ancestor Tarsus Valorum being the Supreme Chancellor that disbanded the Old Republic military a thousand years earlier, forfeiting regions like the Seswana to the criminals. A year later, the Nymoidian pawns were told to carry out a blockade that would lead to the Battle of Naboo. It would be the first appearance of battle droids, vehicles, and starfighters that were all soon to set the galaxy ablaze. As planned, the Naboo crisis would force a veto of no confidence to remove the Chancellor who had been seen as weak for some time now. And newly elected Supreme Chancellor Palpatine made sure to reward his friend Tarkin for the efforts to block the investigation on Ariadu, promising that together they could strip the useless nobles of their power and bring order to the entire galaxy, not just the core. Over the next decade, Governor Tarkin would keep the Greater Seswana as peaceful as possible and would first meet a young, brilliant architect named Orson Krennic, a man who had a similar combination of applied expertise and an understanding of the larger political context. Tarkin would also be approached by fallen Jedi Master Count Dooku. Their first meeting would be on Coruscant, introduced via the Kariva Senator Pascal Argente. Tarkin agreed with Dooku that the Republic was in danger of imploding, but he held that a supervising government, even if ineffectual, was preferable to anarchy and a fractured galaxy. They would have several meetings over the years, as Sidious was secretly testing his loyalty to the Republic, and the Count tried to convince him that Ariadu was an obvious addition to the Confederacy of Separatists. But despite all of Tarkin's hate for the Core Worlders and even the Jedi's uselessness, he would not budge. At this time, many of his academy friends and political allies urged him to run for a seat in the Senate, that he could even help to push through a rumored military creation act, perhaps even fight in a possible Republic army. The lessons of the carry-on were holding true, even if they were more abstract the higher he climbed, and Tarkin knew that he needed to stay in the bush and observe this beast which was now taking place in the form of civil war. He did not agree to side with Dooku or to become a senator. He spent this decade waiting and watching. In 22 BBY, Dooku would step out of the shadows to broadcast a powerful speech condemning the Jedi and Republic, calling for systems to secede, putting himself in position to become the leader of the movement. Several of Ariadu's immediate neighbors had already either stepped away from their Senate positions or outright joined the group that was now calling itself the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Confusion and fear gripped the Senate, but there was still no war at this point, and the only military to speak of on either side were the various police and security forces. The Count's visits to Ariadu became even more frequent, and one evening Dooku was direct, and Tarkin asked why it was all coming to a head now. An imminent crisis, Dooku allowed. I can't say more. But I can. I suspect that you are now close to persuading your secret allies to initiate an economic catastrophe. 
Dooku goes on to say that he knows that Ariadu Mining is experiencing the greatest boon in their history due to the weakened state of the Trade Federation and conflicts in other mining worlds. He pressed further to reveal that many of Ariadu's trade alliances were about to either opt into the Confederacy or be forced to join them, then testing Tarkin's alliance to Palpatine. Is your friend and benefactor on Coruscant in any position to offer you a similar guarantee? With the core contracting around him? The Supreme Chancellor is not required to bribe me into remaining loyal to him. As a compliment to previous bribes, you mean? Going on to try to convince Tarkin that the Chancellor was weak and that his second term was about to come to an end, only a war could keep him in power, it would be the only way to reclaim the Separatist worlds. Tarkin was thoroughly confused. But how would that work? The volunteer security forces of the Confederate worlds against, what, judicials and 10,000 of your former Jedi brethren? A mysterious and arrogant look came over Dooku, saying the governor should not be surprised if the Republic had access to secret forces. The Count tried to push him to admit that he shared a want for an enlightened dictator that could cut through all of the corruption and bureaucracy to finally bring peace to every sector, not just the wealthy ones. And Tarkin asked if he was currently speaking to this future ruler, but Dooku said no, that it was another, someone he would eventually reveal at a later time. And the governor shows that he was not worried by these political games. Unlike those first Tarkin settlers, his family was now at the point that they could ride these waves, not drown in them. I'm simply trying to keep you from finding yourself on the losing side. Tarkin studied him. Will there actually be a losing side for men like you and me? I sometimes suspect that this crisis is a mere charade. Tarkin's mind would go over this memory countless times over the decades, always unconvinced that Dooku was the true puppet master, despite how convincing the official reports were, which claimed that the Clone Wars was planned by the Jedi Order, with Dooku secretly working with the High Council to drag the galaxy into war. After all, the Jedi created the Clone Army, and an ex-Jedi led the Separatist movement, all culminating in the attack on the Chancellor himself. Looking back, the more he remembered his conversations with Dooku, the more he was certain that there was something more to this story. Within days, and in the year 22 BBY, Tarkin would see that indeed a massive clone army had been produced by the Kaminoans, and used by the Jedi in a rescue attempt on Geonosis. Being met with the debt collecting and security droid units that quickly fit into a role as weapons of war. And conveniently, the Chancellor's term was extended with the granting of immediate emergency powers, granting Palpatine full control over this new military and an indefinite extension of his term until peace could be restored. The Republic Navy was under the command of Republic Judiciary leaders and Jedi Masters, who now held the dual title as Jedi Generals, a force that was absent from the galaxy since the time of the Sith Wars. Tarkin would contact Palpatine to assure him that Ariadu and the Greater Sesuana would never fall to the Separatists, and he wished to lead this military, starting at the rank of officer, while retaining his title as governor. To be sure, the droid numbers were great, but he had an easy time outsmarting them, leading to a quick string of victories. Gaining him the rank of captain, he was now commanding planetary invasions, most famously the Battle of Mercana where Tarkin led a brilliantly efficient strike to destroy the holonet relay being used to spread Separatist propaganda and Republic intel via the Shadow Feed. This mission would have him working with spies that would later become ISB agents, and Tarkin would oversee the torture of several Shadow Feed operators to learn some of their methods of encryption and distribution. By the time the smoke cleared, thousands of individuals across this world were executed on the orders of Captain Tarkin. This world would be hotly contested and would trade hands several times over the course of the war, but Palpatine was deeply assured by Tarkin's ruthless efficiency. This is the kind of thing an Imperial leader would need to do to a rebellious population in a future empire. Tarkin would offer strategic advice during the Battle of Kamino, and be paired with Jedi Master Even Peel in a covert op to discover the Nexus Route, a hyperspace lane that could connect Coruscant to the Outer Rim, allowing either side to send strikes directly at the heart of the enemy forces. Tarkin would command the fleet of Venators at the side of his Jedi Superior, a position that he loathed since the times of the Academy. It was never revealed how the CIS discovered them, but their fleet was ambushed, and Captain Tarkin, Master Peel, and several clone officers were taken captive and brought to the most secure prison facility in the galaxy on Lola Seyu. 
As their Venators were being boarded, they were able to delete all records of the Nexus route, Tarkin and Peel memorizing half of the coordinates, so that if one of them broke in torture, they could not reveal the whole thing. The Jedi Order could not allow this information to be lost, and launched a small strike team to pass through the planetary scanners by encasing themselves in carbonite. They made the slow and stealthy journey into the facility until they were detected, and forced to blast their way to the cells, first to Peel, and then to Tarkin and the officers. When the group's leader, Obi-Wan Kenobi, decided to split up into two groups in order to ensure that the data is again not in one location, Tarkin steps up to posit his own strategy. But surely we'd have more strength in numbers rather than divide us. Obi-Wan has a point. I'll go with him. You go with Skywalker. Furious that he was just ignored by a group of magical monks whose military careers had lasted little more than a year. The 44-year-old governor was paired with the 21-year-old General Skywalker, who was seen as the public hero of the Clone Wars. Tarkin made a point of showing the young man that he was not impressed with their Jedi ways. And in this first meeting between these two, Anakin tries to extinguish some of Tarkin's arrogance. I deserve my trust for those who take action, General Skywalker. Then let me remind you, we rescued you back there, and I reserve my trust for those who understand gratitude. Tarkin would don a resting, unimpressed face as they made their way to the extraction. And what made it utterly unsufferable was the Togruta Padawan. An outrageous circumstance that some 16-year-old alien girl would be involved in this strategizing, let alone give him orders. But the clone troopers were seemingly under the Jedi spell as well. I am concerned that the Jedi have elected this child to lead the group. I've sat with her many times, and I trust her, Captain. The trek would be long and arduous, fighting off multiple droid ambushes and having to improvise their way through the terrain. Uncomfortable in this powerless position as the one being rescued, he resorts to his snark. The slightest electronic pulse could ignite this whole tube. I hope somebody tells the droids that. As they make their way through the tunnel leading to the extraction point, Tarkin speaks candidly about his views on Skywalker and the Jedi. That he's surprised to see that Anakin is one of the good ones, but that the Order itself was hopeless. The Jedi Code prevents them from going far enough to achieve victory, to do whatever it takes to win. The very reason why peacekeepers should not be leading a war. Have I offended you? No. I've also found that we sometimes fall short of victory because of our methods. Well, I see we agree on something. When they emerge, they are set upon again, but Skywalker's quick reactions save the group, although Kenobi's team had just been spotted as they made their way onto the landing pad. Both groups united just in time for all of them to be pinned down by the turrets and swarm of droids, and Tarkin steps up with another plan. We need to launch a full forward assault and take that vessel! Kenobi warns that they must take out the turrets first, and in the confusion of all the blaster fire from STAPs and commando droids, Echo thought he saw an opening to make a run for the shuttle. In Tarkin's mind, this clone would not have died if they had all rushed the shuttle immediately, going together as soon as they stepped on that landing pad. But now they were all forced to retreat, and after sending an encrypted call back to Coruscant, the High Council agreed that they could not lose all these Jedi and Republic personnel. They agreed the only option would be to launch a massive fleet that would have to blast their way to freedom. All of the planetary forces were focused on trying to track the strike team through the cave systems and across lava fields. And in the breaks in the fighting, Captain Tarkin would continue to prod. And Ahsoka was so annoyed that she wants to see what Anakin thought of him. Captain Tarkin feels the Jedi should be relieved from the burden of leading the war effort. That's ridiculous. Maybe. But we aren't soldiers. We're peacekeepers. And a few moments later, Anakin tries to give Tarkin some friendly advice about not angering the old curmudgeon even Peel. I stand by my principles, no matter what. Besides, I needn't worry about my career. I've fallen into favor with the Chancellor. I happen to know the Chancellor quite well myself. A surprise to be sure, but a welcomed one, as this proved that Palpatine was an excellent judge of character, Tarkin agreeing that this Jedi was exceptional. The next attack, they would be surrounded by speeders, beasts, and crab droids, and Tarkin would be saved when one of the clone units jumped in front of the incoming bolts. Then they would find out that Master Even Peel was killed by an Anuba. With his final breath, he told Ahsoka his part of the coordinates. This teenager had been entrusted with the same vital data as the 44-year-old military man. Being one of the most fortified worlds in the galaxy, when the Venators launch their fighters and transports, Sacy Tin thinks back to how long it's been since there had been a true galaxy-spanning war. 
There have not been battles like these since the days of the Old Republic. Fighting would be intense to make it to the open area for the LAAT gunship, and Tarkin would find himself one-on-one -on -one with the prison warden. A Findian species, the beast evaded Tarkin's blaster bolts, snatched him up and prepared to toss him into the lava pit, an unceremonious end for a Tarkin patriarch. Perhaps the Force had a sense of humor, as the teenager rushes in to save his life. And despite the absurdity of it all, he had to respect her skills. My thanks, Padawan Tenno. <sighs> As you've trained her well. The extraction would go off as smoothly as possible, and before the rest of the CIS sector fleets could respond, the Republic forces were in the blue void of hyperspace and on their way back to Coruscant. Once they land, all are eager to record the coordinates, but Tarkin is adamant that he will not give them to the Jedi, only to the Chancellor. And annoyed, Ahsoka says that Master Peel gave strict instructions to only give her part to the High Council. Yoda and Palpatine would eventually combine this information and secure the Nexus route, and before Tarkin departs, he makes sure to praise Skywalker for his unique combination of Jedi skills and practical military mind. A job well done, General Skywalker. I wish more Jedi had your military sensibilities. A few months later, Tarkin would be brought into the Strategic Advisory Cell's Special Weapons Group a body of 150 mixed species of various ranks and specialties. One valuable member was Orson Krennic. In fact, the strategic planning amphitheater that they met in, as well as the Naval Intelligence Building, were designed by this rising star. Tarkin had shared on occasion his dream that stemmed from the instruction of his father and guides on the Carrion, that you must focus all of your power in one point to deliver your most powerful blow, be it the head of a spear or high-tech naval weapon. To rule the galaxy, one would need a massive weapon that could scare the beast back into the bush, to hide in the shadows. With a powerful display of this weapon's use, systems could be made to appreciate their station in life. Much like his boyhood servant, Numa, fear of this superweapon's power would keep peace and order in the galaxy. Palpatine agreed, and he would reveal to Tarkin plans seized for a moon-sized battle station that were developed by the Geonosians. With the Geonosian system locked down by the Republic after the Second Battle of Geonosis, automated construction of this station had begun, started by the brilliant architect Orson Krennic. But Palpatine wanted Tarkin to take control of this project and oversee the incredibly complex operations. Tarkin was promoted to adjunct general and maintained a permanent office near the Senate building on Coruscant, orchestrating the big picture while Lieutenant Commander Krennic lived, worked, and supervised on the construction site. The same foundries that once created the droid army were being repurposed to make parts for the Death Star, raw materials sourced from the mineral-rich ring around the very planet that kicked off the Clone Wars. The Jedi were not informed of this secret project, and members of the Special Weapons Group signed agreements that to divulge any information would be seen as treason, and punishable by death. During one meeting of the Special Weapons Group, an alien engineer led the presentation to show that the Prime Meridian had been completed, and they were starting to construct the equator, to be followed by latitudinal bands to rough out a sphere. One question over the source of a labor force was answered with, Their cell subcommittee is considering providing the Kaminoans with a template to grow a labor force of clones adapted for deep space work. And other questions about the nature of the so-called super laser and its power source were less assuring. Many of the greatest minds in the Republic are working on it. Nevertheless, the weapon will require something truly novel in the realm of energy enhancement. Krennic sat back in confident repose, convinced that fate had supplied the means for him to move to the front row. This was the key to Krennic's advancement, or so he thought. In the Academy, he was close friends with Galen Erso, considered to be one of, if not the greatest scientific minds of their generation. The problem was that he was a staunch pacifist, and his convictions deepened even further during the Clone Wars. The man that all were certain would be one of the most successful and prolific scientists of the time, surely to be given anything he asked for if it would help the Republic in a time of war, instead decided to work with companies to develop more energy-efficient power systems, using, of all things, kyber crystals. He researched ways to make synthetic kyber, and was often hamstrung by the Jedi's monopoly on the crystal that powered their lightsabers, a material that held a spiritual significance as a living rock, a conduit of force connection with the Jedi. 
As Urso's promising career was forgotten by most, Krennic knew that this personal connection would be his competitive advantage over the older and more politically connected Tarkin. Krennic would keep up his friendship with Urso and his family, while planting seeds that he was working with a black budget group on Coruscant, essentially a blank check and access to everything he needed to make his breakthrough in crystal physics. Urso refused to work with the government for some time, until the planet Vault was taken over by the Separatists. They captured the Zerpin Industries research facility and tortured Urso before he finally was rescued by his old friend, Krennic. Republic intelligence was worried about what the Separatists might have extracted, why they were interested in Kyber research, and this whole incident was used to scare members of the Special Weapons Group that indeed Dooku was trying to construct his own battle station with a copy of the Geonosian plans. Once Urso was released by Republic Intelligence, he was brought over to General Tarkin's office. He assured the scientists that this was an informal chat, and that sadly there was concern that the Separatists would attempt another kidnapping, that it was too dangerous to leave Coruscant. When Tarkin pushed that he could use this time to continue his research to help bring an end to the war, Urso's pacifist side came out. Again, I'm not interested in supporting the war in any capacity. You were educated, at considerable expense, in an elite program founded by the Republic and at a succession of institutions thereafter. I don't recall being under any obligation to repay that debt. You're not. But let's be frank, Dr. Erso. You see how this looks. A brilliant researcher refusing to lift a finger to help his government. This was followed by a dive into the research of several crystal experts across the galaxy, impressing Urso with his wide conceptual understanding of the difficulties of the field, and what was applicable and what was still just some abstract theory. But Tarkin ends this by shocking the scientists by accusing him of treason. I'm simply trying to determine if Volt's willingness to exchange such a brilliant researcher for two rather ordinary ones wasn't engineered to place you back on Coruscant as a double agent. This was in fact just a ruse to befriend Urso himself, to reveal that he had been tortured on Lola Seyu for weeks, that he did not believe the other's concerns that Urso may have flipped, but knew he could if caught again, before saying that nonetheless he trusted Orson Krennic, and knew the pair were old friends. For this, Tarkin said he would put a good word in on Urso's behalf, and try and get him permission to leave Coruscant as soon as possible though this would still take months. Krennic would hear of this meeting, and knowing he could not directly lead Urso into the program, he told him of an opening at Helical Hypercom, a job that he knew would drive Urso mad with boredom, and would come back begging him to have access to a lab soon enough. Tarkin would maintain an acquaintanceship with Urso since their meeting, picked up on some of Krennic's scheming, and agreed that Urso should fill the opening. Later this year, in 19 BBY, Tarkin would be promoted to the rank of Admiral, and would attend the Republic Strategy Conference on Space Station Valor, located above the world of Corita, a pillar of Republic military power for thousands of years within the Old Republic. The calm of the meeting was shattered by the sight of an unknown Venator barreling towards them. Z9 says he cannot make contact with anyone. We are scanning a large amount of Rhydonium on that ship. It's a bomb. This explosion was just seconds away from taking out much of the Republic and Jedi leadership. It would have likely forced an end to the war. Perhaps this was just one of the many times in which CIS underlings almost inadvertently foiled Darth Sidious' plans. If this was planned by the Sith, it certainly worked to reinforce the idea that the Republic was always close to defeat, useful in keeping the citizenry and top military brass afraid and screaming for a strong leader. We are now just weeks away from the end of the Clone Wars. We are in the year 19 BBY, just weeks before the end of the Clone Wars, and the Jedi Temple had just been bombed. Destruction at this hallowed temple had not been experienced since the time of the Sith Empire. Skywalker had been able to track down the culprit, and there was a sigh of relief when it appeared that all involved were either dead or in custody. This is a Jedi matter, isn't it? Clones were killed, which makes this terrorist attack a military matter. Tarkin is right. Leta isn't a Jedi. It's not for us to be judge and jury over a citizen of the Republic. And never to mince words, Tarkin cut to the point and explained that the Jedi would be out of the war room before long. The Chancellor feels very strongly that the Jedi be removed from as many military matters as possible. You yourselves said that you're peacekeepers, not soldiers. 
Later that day, Tarkin would have to interrupt a Jedi strategy conference to tell the Council that the bomber said she wanted to speak with Ahsoka Tano. Commander Tano, your presence is requested by prisoner Letta Tumong. When the Padawan went to speak with her, it was only minutes before the only surviving witness was force choked to death. All of it caught on Holocam. The Coruscant Guard rushed in to detain her and reported all to Admiral Tarkin. I went in the room to talk to Letta and she said she was afraid of a Jedi. Seems the Jedi she was afraid of was you. He was growing thoroughly tired of dealing with this inept cult. The evidence was obvious and he would see to it that she was executed for treason. Hopefully this annoying girl, a symbol of the ridiculous state of the Jedi Order, could be used as a wedge to finally drive the parasites off of the Republic military structure. Tarkin would be stunned to hear that she escaped, further incriminating herself, as Commander Thorne and even her friends Captain Rex and General Skywalker saw firsthand the guards that had been slashed through by a Jedi blade. I do not believe that Ahsoka could have fallen so far. The beliefs of the Jedi Council are irrelevant. We deal strictly in facts and evidence. After a lengthy manhunt, they do eventually track her down to the bowels of Coruscant, where they observe her with known Separatist general and Sith assassin, Ventress. And when they capture her, she's in a warehouse containing the nanodroids used in the temple bombing. He knows that normally the fate of the Jedi was solely determined by the Jedi, but precedents had to be broken in these unprecedented times. He also studied their complex laws and codes, and knew that Jedi had been expelled before. Ah yes, Jedi tradition. I'm afraid, Master Yoda, that the Senate believes that an internal Jedi trial would seem biased. Therefore, the Senate asked that the Council expel Ahsoka Tano from the Jedi Order. Though Mace can see that this was a show of power, to remove the Jedi as equal and independent, and place them under the commands of the Republic military. Kenobi thinks it is obvious that they will not throw Ahsoka to the military, but everybody else in the room thinks that the evidence is too overwhelming. Even Mace knows that as much as he wanted to save face, it must go through with their internal trial, and without any evidence to prove her innocent, they do expel and deliver her to the Coruscant Guard. Like Tarkin had told Skywalker numerous times, the Jedi morality was the hole in their armor. Tarkin knew that to give up one of your own to appease someone else made you weak, and this weakness would drive some members of the Order mad, stuck in this untenable position as warrior monks. It was just perfect that the one who would be hurt the most, the ones whose faith in the Order would be shaken the most, would be the only cunning Jedi he ever met, Ahsoka's master. I shall prove that you were the mastermind behind the attack on the Jedi Temple. I ask the court that the full extent of the law be brought down upon you, including penalty of death. The only problem was that Skywalker cared a lot more for Ahsoka than he did the opinion of the Jedi Order. He would hunt down Ventress and use some unique interrogation techniques to extract the truth. That the Padawan was being framed, and with her account he tracked down the true conspirator, Barriss Offee. With her capture and admission, Tarkin was robbed of this seemingly airtight case. But though he lost, his blow to the Jedi Order was delivered as he was surprised and delighted to hear that the rude alien girl was smarter than she looked, that she had seen through the lies of the Jedi and walked away. Devastating Skywalker. Perhaps he would be the next one to leave this ridiculous cult. Just a few months later, Admiral Tarkin would be one of the several admirals scrambling to keep up with the Separatist Outer Rim sieges. A blitzkrieg of attacks that were rolling over entire sectors with astounding speed and efficiency, only to then be shocked with a surprise invasion of Coruscant. The streams of intel were like an orbital bombardment to his famous calm and cool leadership. His mind racing as reports claimed that Dooku and Grievous were personally leading this attack on the capital of the galaxy. They were really trying to end this war within a few hours. He knew that an ugly secret was that the Coruscant home defense fleet was often neglected. They had never been tested in actual combat, and all within the military knew that as the war dragged on, assets from the home defense were siphoned off to strengthen the systems most at need. Then came the devastating news that his friend and greatest political ally, the Supreme Chancellor himself, was captured by the Separatists. Sheer madness that was somehow resolved just as quickly as it had developed. That cunning Jedi Skywalker personally rescuing their mutual friend. And the fleets that scrambled back home driving off the CIS's largest planetary invasion fleet ever seen. Grievous was on the run, and the leader of the entire Separatist movement, Count Dooku, was killed. Their old conversation echoed in his mind, the Count tirelessly trying to pull Ariadu out of the Senate, and Tarkin's own overconfident words. I'm simply trying to keep you from finding yourself on the losing side. Tarkin studied him. 
Will there actually be a losing side for men like you and me? If not true for Dooku, it was only because he failed to see the power of Sheev Palpatine. Grievous was dead, and an assassin had killed much of the Separatist leadership meeting on Mustafar. A shutdown order was sent through the Separatist fleets, and none of that was the shocking part. Though he hated the order, he was surprised to hear of their attempted coup in the final hours of the war, Mace Windu personally leading the charge into the Chancellor's office. Most assume that the Senate Guard and clone troopers present must have been the ones to save their beloved leader, who immediately used his emergency powers to make himself Emperor. To the cheering applause of the Coruscanti, shell-shocked by the CIS invasion and believing the Jedi were playing the galaxy all along, the secret source of the clones, with a supposedly fallen Jedi leading the Separatists. But Tarkin, and many others that dared to look into the events of that night, were unsatisfied with the official account. The Admiral wondered if anyone else had put it all together. The meek Naboo man had survived the attack by four Jedi Masters, and then instructed the clone army to kill each and every Jedi across the galaxy on charges of treason against the Republic. He understood this cult was a useless, vestigial organ left over from ancient times, but Palpatine's ruthless complete removal of the Jedi was astounding, though it gave him a clue to the true nature of his old pal. And so Tarkin had his private thoughts about the Emperor as well. That he and Vader were kindred spirits suggested that both of them might be Sith. Tarkin often wondered if that wasn't the actual reason Palpatine had been targeted for arrest or assassination by the Jedi. It wasn't so much that the Order wished to take charge of the Republic, it was that the Jedi couldn't abide the idea of a member of the ancient Order they opposed and abhorred emerging as the hero of the Clone Wars and assuming the mantle of Emperor. There was also the issue of the sudden appearance of one Darth Vader. The body of Anakin Skywalker was never recovered, and he supposedly died trying to defend the Jedi Temple. Anakin's forces, the 501st, led the attack. Skywalker was the only Jedi he ever met that strayed from the Jedi mindset and was a close friend of Palpatine. And now a previously unknown, powerful force wielder comes out of nowhere and is Emperor Palpatine's right-hand man. He would later learn that Vader was once a Jedi. It was all clear to Tarkin that this empire was led by a Sith, that ancient order that understood power. And they certainly had the tools and weapons to enforce order over every sector of the galaxy. He would be made head of the eponymous Tarkin Initiative, the lead project successor to the Republic's Special Weapons Group, and would continue the development of the mobile space station known as the Death Star. All Tarkin Initiative projects would take place in secret hive base facilities or remote uninhabited worlds. He was often paired with the Imperial Security Bureau and gained a new Imperial title, Moth. The Senate would stick around for the next 19 years, but with each year their actual power diminished. Moff Tarkin of the Greater Seswana Sector could override the request of any senator from their sector. And of course, the Emperor had complete veto power and executive power. In addition to the weapons programs, Tarkin would oversee most of the Emperor's secret initiatives. The next two decades would see him trying to tie up loose ends around the galaxy, but the first would be a potential threat from outside the galaxy. The Moff would land on the rain-soaked capital of Kamino, the stilt city of Taipoka, departing from his new class shuttle with a contingent of Coruscant guards. Tarkin's meeting with Lama Su was blunt and direct, explaining that effective immediately, the Kaminoans' contracts were cancelled, and he would be the one to evaluate any possible use for the cloners. Your contracts were with the Republic, which no longer exists. Clone troopers will be needed to maintain order throughout the galaxy. Indeed, a service conscription soldiers could provide at half the cost. The skill level and efficiency of our clones is far superior to that of any recruited body. I shall be the judge of that, Prime Minister. The test would put Bad Batch through a combat proficiency challenge, but this is all theater at this point. The option of an independent people retaining the knowledge and ability to produce an army was out of question, and if anyone knew how evasive these Kaminoans could be, it was Darth Sidious. Tarkin wished to show the superiority of one of the new Imperial secret droid programs, a unit that would eventually lead to the DT series and Dark Trooper project. Years later, a Dark Trooper iteration would be cyborgs, not droids, putting the hardened warrior minds of Clone Wars commanders to good use in a new robotic body. The ultimate insulting ending to these men who prided themselves on killing clankers for the Republic. 
The hope was that he could make his point by killing these supposedly elite clones. Tarkin, annoyed at this surprising performance, turns on his heel and departs in silence, and he was curious to hear about the possibility of modified elite troopers for specialized roles. Reports indicate they exhibit a concerning level of disobedience and disregard for orders. A side effect of their mutation. Yet one that has never hindered the completion of their missions. Then they executed Order 66. Palpatine's orders were to secure key Kaminoan scientists for another one of his more secretive projects. But first and foremost for Tarkin was to see if loyalty remained as they started getting into super soldier territory. We have tracked a group of insurgents to the Onderon sector. They must be dealt with. A real world test for Clone Force 99 would also tie up another Clone Wars loose end to eliminate Saw Gerrera and his band of freedom fighters turned enemy of the state. He was sure to have an Imperial probe droid monitor them and it saw Crosshair was the only one willing to obey their orders. What Hunter and his brother saw as innocent civilians, many children, Tarkin understood to be agents of chaos. As soon as Bad Batch returned to their homeworld, they would be immediately arrested. I assume you know the punishment for treason? And while the clones were arguing, Tarkin was on his way to salvage the only loyal member of this experimental group. Crosshair was willing to kill a group of rebels, and Tarkin wanted to see if the cloner's technology could save this talented unit from termination. Can you intensify the program? Yes. Then proceed. Hours later, the rest of the defective and traitorous units would try to make their escape, and Tarkin figured this was the perfect test of his sniper's loyalty. The armor that Crosshair is sporting is the first instance of what would become the Death Troopers, one of the top military units that would be seen protecting Imperial VIPs. While the Bad Batch would escape, Tarkin had faith in their ability to track down traitors, and wanted to meet with Vice Admiral Rampart who was just starting to implement chain codes, the ingenious system that combined genetic and property databases with a blockchain to one day be able to track the movements of everyone and everything across the galaxy. Rampart was also tasked with creating a new Imperial force. What is the status of Project War Mantle? On schedule, sir. Our top recruits are here to begin their training. Walking them over to a group of more soldiers in proto-Death Trooper armor, explaining that they could have the very best of the recruited soldiers from across the galaxy. Many militia veterans have fought in the Clone Wars and have been trained by the best of the clones. Nalase realizes that these are the first steps away from Kamino being central to the Empire. And later Lama Su would share his doubts that a recruit force could ever rival one shaped from birth. Instead of debating, the Moth wanted evidence. A tangible test is in order. We need to see them in action. By all means. Send the clone and your recruits to Onderon. The team would blast their way through Saw Gerrera's forces, though the terrorist leader did escape. When the civilians refused to give up any intel, Crosshair shot one in the chest, and when one of the conscripted troops said that they couldn't slaughter these people, he was shot down too. Crosshair was able to get the troops to follow orders, something that proved the efficacy of Project War Mantle. The clone trooper program is a cost prohibitive relic of the past. Our forces will be unlike anything the galaxy has seen. Then I leave this project in your capable hands, Admiral. Thank you, sir. Rampart would organize the withdrawal of all valuable assets, including ships, vehicles, weapons, and troopers, while the cloners tried to keep the younger units calm during this upheaval. Your training will continue elsewhere. One of those places where clones were taken to was a hidden mountain complex where clone commandos were seen training new TK troops, soon to be known throughout the galaxy as stormtroopers. Before he gives the order, Tarkin confirms that the top cloners and technology were now in Imperial hands, crucial to the most top secret project the Emperor would ever undertake. All essential personnel have been removed from Kamino. And the chief scientist? Secured. The cloning technology is now firmly under Imperial control. Very good, Admiral. You may fire when ready. With this order, Tarkin had tied up one of the most obvious loose ends from the times of the chaotic and ineffective Republic. These secret allies of the Jedi were destroyed, and the means of clone production was now in the hands of the Central Authority. Around this same time, Krennic had finally been able to get Galen Erso to join something called Project Celestial Power. The Emperor was personally requesting that he come aboard, pleading that in this time of rebuilding a war-torn galaxy, the genius could use any and all assets he wished to crack the secret of drawing energy from the Kyber Crystal. In fact, without the Jedi Order holding back that process, Erso would have access to things researchers could previously only dream of. 
the empire has unrestricted access to worlds that for centuries were accessible only to the order. Not just these small samples, but enormous crystals. Boulder sized, I'm told. Even larger. Sometime after this, Tarkin would be summoned to personally report on the progress of the Death Star to the Emperor and his top aide, Grand Vizier Masamita. And it appears that he may have been about to talk about Galen Erso's involvement when Darth Vader burst into the room, force pushing the royal guards into the transparent steel so hard that it cracked and left them unconscious. Battle torn, the mysterious Sith Lord approached the Emperor, and Tarkin was shocked to hear the old man calmly asked to be left alone. And days later, Tarkin may have died at the mechanical hand of this being, if it had not been for the protection of the Emperor. Being a mysterious newcomer, Vader had survived two attacks on his life, knowing it came from officers hoping to take his position at the side of the Emperor. To strike fear into the core, he would select five of these officers at random and force choke them while their comrades tried to stay composed. It is after this incident that we would see Tarkin traveling aboard a Venator, repainted into the Imperial Grey, to personally show the Emperor and this dangerous Vader the progress of the Death Star Battle Station. And while Krennic would be left to head the project, and continue to coerce Urso, Moff Tarkin would be tasked to put his military expertise to good use in snuffing out the first embers of dissent in this new empire. The flame of rebellion was raging on the water world of Mon Cala. This world, home to grotesque alien species that had been allies of the Jedi and anti-war movements, would be the perfect people to make an example of. In 18 BBY, he would lead the assault via an Imperial One-class Star Destroyer, the Sovereign while Vader was tasked with finding and eliminating Order 66 survivors, which were said to be aiding Clone Wars hero King Leechar. Major Rantu was charged with preparing the stormtroopers in simulations for aquatic combat, while Commander Jordo proposed the idea of spreading propaganda to drive a wedge into the historic rift between the Mon Calamari and Quarren, who were even recently enemies in the Clone Wars, and had always had sporadic fighting since their first contact with each other eons ago. After the briefing, Tarkin was informed that a Zeta-class shuttle was descending towards the planet, and he knew this must be the Sith and the Inquisitorius. On World, Ambassador Telvar was meeting with the King to discuss a peaceful transition from independence into the Imperial Fold. But right after Vader's forces emerged, the Ambassador's shuttle explodes. Tarkin is unsure what caused this, but it would rush the invasion forces to initiate the Battle of Dak City. The sky was filled with TIE fighters and modified LAAT carriers with the new Imperial troop transports, securing the landing zones for walkers like the AT-AT and AT-DP. Leechar's top military advisors were Akbar and Radis, and they planned the counterattack and evacuation of the above water population, while the King contacts Tarkin. The Moth uses the death of the Ambassador as evidence that either the King has ordered the attack on the Empire, or he has no control over his population. Either required the Empire to take control and impose order. While Vader confronted Leechar, Tarkin witnessed the natives use wildlife to cause a tsunami that completely destroyed all of their above-water cities. While the officers were in shock, Tarkin expected this move explaining that this made it more difficult for the invaders to have a staging area, while only giving up what equated to outposts. Their true civilization was a thousand times larger than these lost ports, and all safely underwater. Tarkin is furious with his ISB agent, who supposedly had a complete profile on the technological wonders of these people, ranging from the galaxy-leading shield generators and energy systems, but their mastery of sea life was not fully understood by the Empire. The next stage of the battle would see Admiral Raddus organizing all of the Calamari Reef ships at the Southern Pole. These structures essentially being massive city-sized ships, while Commander Akbar would lead the attack on the Empire's floating staging platform. Leading from the front, an understanding of his craft and Imperial defense systems, he had them unload their complete missile payload at once, proving to be too many objects for the autocannons to intercept, turning this crucial asset into a ball of flames that came crashing into the seas. But the propaganda had not worked to divide all of the Quarren, and they were able to find and rescue the King from the brink of death. Back on the Sovereign, Tarkin is impressed when he hears the explanation of Akbar's strategy, using solid projectile weapons, knowing the shields were most effective against energy weapons like turbolasers. He was equally unimpressed with his ISB agent, who somehow failed to provide intel on this weapon as well, and for this, Tarkin orders the agent to be put into standard trooper armor and sent to the front lines. Well, he resolved to escalate this conflict. With this surge, the Empire was winning every battle, but at a great cost, as they were drawn to fight in the watery corridors in confusing enemy territory, or chase aquatic species through kelp forests and pitch-black ocean canyons. And he thought Radis's strategy was brilliant. 
Huddling together and linking the massive merchant ships that had shielding for space travel and pirates, and combined, these shields were now impenetrable by the underwater craft of the Imperial Arsenal. Tarkin knew they were entrenched for far longer than the Emperor wished, and thus he hoped to employ some strategic negotiation tactics on Vader, asking the Sith Lord to go after King Leechar and leave his Inquisitors to finish off the Jedi that was still eluding them. Vader was quick to point out that Tarkin could not give him orders, but agreed with the Moff's reasoning, Tarkin saying that if he could help him with this, he would be in the Dark Lord's debt. The fight through the King's guards would be effortless, and once disarmed, Tarkin was hailed with the good news. He hoped that by forcing the King to watch his planet suffer from orbital bombardment, he would see that resistance was futile and call for a surrender. Leechar resisted, and this was all interrupted by the Jedi attacking Vader. After Order 66, Farron Barr had been corrupted, and used evil tactics to grow a small cult of followers, finding anything as permissible that would help bring down the Empire. In the duel, the Jedi revealed that he was behind the destruction of the Ambassador's craft and that he hoped to manipulate Lee Char into conflict with the Empire in order to spark a galactic rebellion. Though corrupted, Barr was seeing something through the Force, a vision that the Mon Calamari people and technology would play a central role in the eventual destruction of the Empire. He even saw into their future role in the New Republic and First Order conflict. When Lee Char heard this confession, he sprung up to contact his forces and order a ceasefire, followed by a call to Tarkin to explain the truth. Tarkin agreed to end the fighting, but still bombarded several locations, adamant that Radis' fleet could not escape. But Radis was crazy enough to try it. He ordered them to fully engage their engines and push past the blockade and was able to escape through hyperspace. Though two cruisers were lost, three did escape. Tarkin's reaction was a calm confidence that this small force would be extinguished soon enough. Though over the years, these three sparks would help grow an inferno of rebellion becoming the technological spine of that chaotic beast known as the Rebel Alliance that threatened Tarkin's life work to establish galactic order. From here, Tarkin would be tasked to make an example out of Antar IV, a world that started off allied to the Republic, but quickly turned separatist. It did retain a powerful minority of Republic support that was covertly aided by Republic intelligence forces, planning and supplying materials for terrorist attacks on world. But the Republic could never flip the planet, and because it was a powerful separatist stronghold, Palpatine hoped to prove that this new empire could not be denied like its weaker predecessor. Tarkin rounded up thousands of civilians on charges of treason and executed them without any court process, knowing that in these massive sweeps they were killing countless Clone Wars heroes that were loyal assets to the Republic. This is one of the first times the media and public started to question the Emperor as news did make its way back to Coruscant. But the media eventually got hold of the story. And for a while, the Antar atrocity had become a celebrated cause in the core. The disappearances so fueled the public's hunger for details that the Emperor decided to remove Tarkin from the controversy by assigning him to pacification operations in the Western Reaches and had ultimately installed him as commander of the bases servicing the Deep Space Mobile Battle Station project. During this time, Tarkin would put down countless local rebellions and minor separatist holdouts, and it cemented in his mind the idea that these vermin could only be ruled through fear, that the Death Star was crucial to the peace of the Empire, as you could use the obedient masses to expose the rebel minority, knowing that being seen as a rebel outpost wouldn't just result in a battle that you could flee from one day and return another, it could mean that your entire planet would be destroyed, completely and forever, wiped from the galaxy. The western reaches were also home to countless asteroids, moons, barren worlds, and some populated ones that were full of untapped resources. And Krennic couldn't stand the fact that by pure luck, Tarkin was now managing this area of space. The rings over Geonosis were proving to be tapped, specifically of Dunamite and Dolavite, and Krennic hoped that mining could continue under the radar in the western reaches. Some of the most minerally rich planets happened to be labeled Legacy Worlds, an annoying holdover from the ineffective Republic era that protected worlds seen as worth preserving due to their cultural importance or natural beauty. They both agreed that to get around this, they could use Imperial secret project funds to finance recently ex-separatist companies and do the illegal mining under their name. By the time anyone caught wind of this and put a stop to it, estimates said that they would have strip mined these worlds down to the bedrock, gaining all the materials needed to secure peace. 
They carried this plan out, and Tarkin was glad to see that he was correct in avoiding taking up full hands-on leadership of this project until it was further along. These constant delays and issues from scientists to minerals made him concerned that this project may never be finished. Better leave Krennic in place to take the blame. But incendiary Krennic was perfectly suited to be the one held accountable for all the setbacks and delays that were bound to plague the project. The Emperor was also eyeing him to assume command and control of the battle station. To avoid having to accept the privilege prematurely, he would have to continue to defer to Krennic until the proper time. Again, his interests would line themselves up neatly in the actions of a smuggler named Haz Obit. Krennic had used him to rescue the Ursos, and now was in a joint plan with Tarkin to smuggle arms to mining operations, in effect framing them to look like rebel allies, which would then cue an Imperial investigation and lead to takeover. But as Obit saw these mining worlds completely devastated, he started to develop genuine rebel sympathies. In the salient system, he was able to warn Saul Guerrero's partisans about the next Imperial takeover, and would slightly embarrass Tarkin and expose their planting of evidence. When Tarkin's fleet claimed that they had intel that they were harboring rebels and weaponry, the mining representative denied this and insisted the imps search the entire facility, coming up with nothing. The rep had suspected this imperial tactic and gave strict instructions to deny all company ships from ever landing on the moon. Tarkin was forced to turn heel and leave, but noticed that Krennic's smuggler was going deeper into the star system, toward the planet Salient 2. Now this was all in the corporate sector, one of the only regions of the galaxy that was able to retain its autonomy from the Republic, CIS, and now Empire. When the massive Imperial Star Destroyer was picked up, they rushed out and demanded Tarkin to stand down, and that they would eliminate the smuggler ships. Tarkin was concerned that the corporate sector was secretly backing rebel forces, as Saul Guerrero was able to use Obit's intel to secure a few victories. He theorized that Krennic knew Obit's allegiance was faltering, and that by sending him to frame systems in the corporate sector, Krennic hoped to bait Tarkin into a battle that he would lose, embarrassing his rival, while also showing that the Imperial Star Destroyer was not enough, that the Death Star was the Empire's only hope. To test this, Tarkin called for support from a pair of destroyers over Telos, and conducted a micro-jump to pop out of hyperspace just out of range of the planetary defense forces of Salient 2. His suspicions were correct, and he hailed their defense fleet to demand that they give up the rebels. We know that the insurgents have made planet fall. Are you now prepared to surrender them to our custody? We decline to do so, Moff Tarkin as they will be crucial to exposing the Empire's subterfuge. This was a problem as the Imperial framing tactic could be exposed, and still suspicious, Tarkin had the Ambassador's shuttle scanned. No signs of life were detected, and he shouted an order to lock that ship in place with the ISD's powerful tractor beam. The next beat would see three corporate sector warships emerge from behind Salient 2 and open fire on the Executrix. Tarkin made sure his command ship was outside of the range of the powerful planet-side turbolaser batteries, and the Ambassador's shuttle exploded in a massive fireball that proved it was a drone bomb ship. Tarkin now found himself in the most intense fighting he had seen since the Clone Wars, though through all the chaos he was forming a smirk at the thought of just how brazen young Krennic was. Taken off his guard, Tarkin was willing to admit to himself that he had underestimated Orson Krennic who was certainly the chief architect of the mess in which Tarkin found himself. This initial fight would last for hours, both forces tactically retreating and reorganizing. Imperial aid came in the form of two Venators and a swarm of ARC-170s, which after weeks of fighting, eventually gave them that original moon they were hoping to take, and then carried out the destruction of most of Salient 2's fleet. With the planetary shield projector disabled, their government sued for peace, and the ARC-170s would act in a blockade role, while well, surveys showed that anything of value, including the mining operations on the moon and planet, were both sabotaged. Militias were dug in planet-wide, and Tarkin knew that it would take months to clear them out, and more than six months to take Salient 1 with the forces that he currently had. To further embarrass him, when Tarkin hailed Masamita to update him on the progress and request more forces, the Shagrian kept noting that the transmission was cutting out and unstable, to which he finally had to admit that the salient forces were jamming him. And when the Vizier denied his request for troops or TIE fighters, Tarkin is frustrated and direct. If I didn't know better, Vizier, 
I might almost think that you're attempting to undermine my efforts. My grandstanding, as you call it, is part of the cost of moving the battle station project toward completion. This was not just a military embarrassment, but a PR issue exploited by the anti-imperial members of the Senate. And Amita used this delay as a way to jab at Tarkin's concept of the Moths, saying, You have advocated that the Moths be entrusted with sector control. Amida was saying, when it appears that you are incapable of subduing a single star system without Coruscant's help. Tarkin was furious at this situation Krennic had drawn him into, but knew the only way out was to fight for an eventual victory. For Salient One, he ordered a blitzkrieg rush of all of his forces that would take the world before they could sabotage their facilities. And this worked to rush a near immediate surrender, followed up by their forces finding Haas Obit's hideout. A Venator would collapse the cave system they were using, but scanner droids identified a single survivor, proving why the smuggler's moniker with the Partisans was Lucky Has. With a back to treatment, he awoke on the med bay of the Executrix, and Tarkin explained his options were to be tortured to death in Imperial prison, or flip on Krennic and help to undermine him. To Abbott, this was a win-win. He said that he was the one that rescued the Ursos, and it was Lyra Urso that convinced him that the Empire was doing horrible things to these worlds. And he believed that her husband Galen Urso wanted to flee the Empire as well. Obit wanted to save his friends and hamstring the Death Star project, while Tarkin would be able to get his revenge, turning his major defeat into something that could be used to separate Krennic from the project. Tarkin warned Krennic of Abbott's escape and said that he was tracked to Coruscant, and though Krennic worried that it may be to smuggle out the Ursos, when Obit showed up, there was no one with him, the smuggler claiming that he just hoped to hide out in the lower levels. All the while, Obit had set up Saw Gerrera to coordinate the Ursos' extraction, so Obit was with Krennic when this happened, and thus seemingly blameless, and vowed to cause disruptions in the Death Star project, providing all the intel to Tarkin in exchange for him keeping his identity as the smuggler rebel a secret. With this single action, the Emperor's wrath was now focused on Krennic, him stammering to explain how the project could continue with the loss of its lead scientist. The weapon and energy system production came to a halt, but building out the rest of the facility could continue. Palpatine wanted Tarkin to put an end to the pursuits of separatists and smugglers in the western reaches, and to make Sentinel Base his new home personally overseeing the Death Star progress from a network of supply stations and moons over Geonosis. And within the military, rumors were split over Tarkin's new assignment, some thinking that a classified project must be located in the otherwise dull and quiet Geonosian system, or that this was indeed punishment from the Emperor. Though the Sentinel base was his home, he did have to travel out to oversee the countless mining operations that other Imperials were capturing with their own campaigns, now focusing on the material Quadanium, the especially durable steel variant used to make up the large rectangular plates on the Death Star, but also in everything from Star Destroyers to TIE Fighters. One of these mining worlds was Agaris, and more delays were resulting from mysterious disappearances of Imperial droids. Most of wild space exploration was made possible by the cartography work of the now traitorous Auric and Risa Graf, whose children were believed to have joined a rebel cell on Lothal. This was the first Tarkin would ever hear of the backwater planet Lothal. And the problem was that the Graf family droid contained useful data on this region. Tarkin was working with a KX series security droid known by the designation K4D8 who many believed was secretly spying for Krennic, but nonetheless, Tarkin used it to help with the monitoring of the shipments while he tried to locate the Graf children, and simultaneously try to extract intel from the imprisoned parents by claiming that he had their children in Imperial custody. Reports said that there was a crash landing on the fungus moon of Agaris, and he suspected that this was the rebel runs attempting a prison break. Tarkin's tactics with the parents were to remain kind to them, even offering a rare white Alderanian wine, but when he hinted that this world was devoid of sentient life to be stripped to bedrock, he noticed the husband was trying to hide some sort of fear, as if there was some unreported life form here that could be lost. K4 was sent to investigate the crash site, and did find the family droid with the hidden data, returning to Tarkin with its severed head. Upon review, he learned that the Grafs were trying to cover up the existence of a sentient fungus species, which they knew had no hope of defeating the Empire, only hiding off the official maps. He summoned the prisoners and explained that he found their secrets, and if these natives could not be worked as slaves, they would be made extinct. And he said that their children were about to be executed as well. He then left them alone, and the pair were able to make an escape, 
meeting up with the children who had snuck into the facility. As they ran towards an exit, stormtroopers surrounded them, and Tarkin calmly walked out to explain that he knew this would draw the children out. With all of them in custody, he hoped to torture them and reveal the identities of rebel leaders on Lothal. The first round of torture would be to watch their sentient fungal friends be burned alive. All were outfitted with gas masks to protect them from the poisonous emissions, and a row of flame troopers walked towards a large collection of natives. Tarkin also prepared TIE bombers which were screaming in overhead. But just as he was about to conclude his victory speech, organic weaponry in the form of spiked spores rocketed out of the jungles and took down the lead bomber. The fiery wreck consumed the courtyard, and through the smoke came smaller spore weaponry and the native agrarian warriors storming the imperial facility. Troopers were downed, and Tarkin rushed the prisoners off to his personal stealth corvette, the Carrion Spike. The natives intercepted him and explained that the troopers were not dead, just asleep and would be healed if the Imperials would promise to leave them alone. Tarkin refused, and though he lost control of the prisoners, he would escape on the corvette, leaving K-4 to fight to the death among the fungus. And from the viewport, he watched several organic ships take off from the world, a desperate attempt to evacuate their population in fear of the inevitable orbital bombardment. This was then followed by rebel ships that rescued the Grafs. All of this would see the end to the year 17 BBY, and from then to 14 BBY, Tarkin was being driven slightly insane by the drudgery of this massive construction project. He found himself sitting with an RA-7 protocol droid redesigning the Imperial officer's uniform, which at this point was still the same as the older public one. Tarkin wanted to keep it simple and comfortable, but the droid reminded him that a moth needed to stand out and remind those of his status. As they were working on this design, they were interrupted by some much-needed conflict. Rampart Station was under attack from a cruiser that had presented correct codes, but was now releasing separatist droid fighters. Sir, we have got multiple marks launching from the carrier. They're droid fighters. Tri-fighters, vultures, the whole Sep menagerie. But Tarkin noticed something peculiar in this hollow transmission. The most subtle of issues, but to a man whose life had depended on the analysis of these transmissions for several decades, he saw something that seemed fabricated about these hollows. When he ordered a ship to instantly jump to the spot of the supposed attack, the ship did not show up. Then it made micro jumps around the spread out complex of stations around Geonosis, and eventually it was picked up. Tarkin had found the true location of the attack, far from Rampart. When the Imperial ship engaged the carrier, it released even more droid fighters and was able to escape through hyperspace. This carrier was a smaller version of the Providence-class Dreadnought, specifically built from parts of the Lucid Voice, the sister ship of Grievous's flagship the Invisible Hand, while other parts came from the Invincible. Tarkin didn't bother to mask his surprise. That was Separatist Admiral Trench's ship, destroyed during the Battle of Christosis. The ship was modular in design, and the modules that survived must have been worth salvaging and putting on the open market. His advisor showed him records of how the Free Deck volunteers working at the Bilbringi shipyards had been dismantling these Clone Wars era ships, but there was evidence that credits were making some of these things disappear from the scrapyard and alter records. These Providence-class ships had been one of, if not the best, hyperwave transmitting and encrypting technology, developed out of the mercantile origins of the Separatists, evading pirate attacks and staying coordinated across the galaxy. Somehow, these attackers had used this tech to hijack and even produce false hollow transmissions. But even stranger to Tarkin was the lack of destruction they sought. The mysterious cruiser hadn't discharged any of its point defense or ranged weapons. Why hadn't whoever was behind the attack used the ship as a bomb by reverting from hyperspace in closer proximity to the moon? Planetary bodies larger than Sentinel had been shaken to their core by such events. While Tarkin was reviewing all the data being collected by his officers, he was interrupted by a call from Masamita, who again was probing and insinuating at the difficulties the Moss was having with keeping order. He thought of how Grand Uncle Jova would have loved to have had a Shagrian head mounted in his cabin, and after some verbal jousting, Amida finally reveals that it was the Emperor requesting that he speak with him personally on Coruscant. Tarkin ended the call and rushed to RA-7, telling him to get the new uniform crafted immediately. Tarkin summoned the uniformed 3D image of himself from the hollow table and regarded it, thinking back to Iriadu and recalling Jova's comment once more. It'll look even better with blood on it. The trip would be via the carrion spike, and he conducted a flash inspection of his crew, finding a stain on a boot that, through a series of questions and observations, resulted in him revealing that one of his crew was a spice user, and that there may even be a group of users on board. 
Even the officers that worked closely with him every day were shocked at how he was able to reveal all of this from a simple stain on a boot, a stain that corresponded with a type of oil only found on a specific speeder held in a part of the ship where he had previously found a discarded spice baggie. Tarkin wanted to be sure that when on Coruscant, his crew would see him like some sort of mind-reading, omniscient god with eyes everywhere that could not be outsmarted, especially while arriving on the custom stealth ship made personally for him. A ship that was perhaps only surpassed by some unknown vessel used by Darth Vader or the Emperor. When he arrived on the capital, he had to dodge the prying questions of those like Nils Tenet, Republic Rear Admiral turned Joint Chief, and when they were brought down into the lower levels of the Jedi Temple, now the Imperial Palace, he saw Vader warning a group of crime bosses to flee Coruscant and go to the Outer Rim, ending his speech by using the Force to explode the heart of a Twi'lek Prefect who managed one of the lower levels. Tarkin smiled as Amida was stricken with fear and excused himself. He was now alone with Vader and mused how this towering, ominous cyborg was the Emperor's first terror weapon. And the more they talked and Tarkin studied his movements, he thought that the rumors that this was some secret alien Sith, a lab abomination, or Palpatine's version of General Grievous was wrong. He was more certain that he knew the face behind this black mask. Vader might very well be Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker whom Tarkin had fought beside during the Clone Wars, and for whom he had developed a grudging appreciation. Vader explained that the droid Gotra, a rebel group comprised solely of droids of all sorts and variety, had been behind a lot of attacks on Coruscant, but he had to cut this conversation short and meet with the Emperor. The new office had some art like the old relief panel of an ancient battle and statue of Sistros, along with new items acquired as spoils of war, and Palpatine thought back on their long friendship. Twenty years ago, who would have thought that two men from the Outer Rim would sit at the center of the galaxy? As they talked about the unruly sectors of the galaxy, Tarkin again pitched his idea that Moff should be assigned to regions of the galaxy, much like the sector army idea of the Clone Wars, but now to manage the resources, rebel uprising, and maintain overall order in their section. Essentially, local dictators that would all refer back to and defer to the Emperor. Palpatine was thinking something similar and agreed to implement a system like this in due time. For now, he wanted them to meet with the ruling council, a mysterious circle of figures with influence even greater than his. Yet these odd fellows like Ars Dangor, Sate Pestage, and Janus Grigatis stood out as ridiculous in their colorful costumes, flanked by grizzled ISB leadership and naval intelligence officers like Vularan. And he was surprised to feel an alien emotion. Tarkin felt awkward and out of place, so he moved towards Darth Vader and Amida. When the meeting opened up, the ISB reported finding a massive stockpile of Separatist equipment similar to that used by the Shadowfeed network, which was able to slice into the holonet and spread propaganda during the Clone Wars, the operation that Tarkin had destroyed with a campaign so violent many considered it a war crime. Tarkin wasn't sure who else in the room knew about the attacks in Geonosian space using faked hollows, and he had the hint at the issue, eventually needing to reveal details like the repurposing of Separatist droids, and the fact that most likely it was an Imperial intelligence expert that was helping these rebels. Ignoring the ISB agent's outrage at the implication, and after further bickering that reminded Tarkin of the Republic era, Masamita stomped down his staff and called for the meeting to end. The ultimate fate of what to do with the stockpile on the planet Mercana would be decided by the Emperor. In the Emperor's chamber, Palpatine explained that there is a supernatural importance to this planet, that the ties to Vader and Tarkin's past here were not a coincidence. Do you not find it intriguing that both you and Moff Tarkin have ties to the very planet where this newly discovered cache of jamming devices has been found, Tarkin to quash Dooku's shadow feeds, and you, in one of your first missions, I seem to recall, to effect an execution. And that, my apprentice, is why Mokana matters to us. Because the dark side of the Force has, for whatever reason, brought that world to our attention once more. When Vader asked who would command this mission, he saw something that Tarkin would also detect. That this was some sort of trial for these two. A sudden glint in his eye, Sidious shrugged. I thought I would allow you and Moff Tarkin to work that out. The Emperor goes further to try and make Vader understand that Tarkin was one of them. Not just in mentality, but in the fact that the Force took preference of him, but also tested him in ways that Vader was not appreciating. Has it never struck you that all three of us, you and Tarkin and I, the Empire's architects, if you will, 
hail from worlds that occupy but a narrow slice of galactic space. Naboo, Tatooine, Iriadu, all within an arc of less than 30 degrees. You are under the misimpression that only Sith and Jedi have trials to pass. Ending the conversation by warning him that Marcana was indeed a trap, but they need to walk into it to uncover who is behind it, and that to learn more of Tarkin, Vader should ask him why his ship is named the Carrion Spike. He may grow to respect the military man more. With this, Vader took a dozen stormtroopers and met with Tarkin, who had sent the rest of his crew except for the captain and comms officer back to the Sentinel base moon. As they entered the ship, he noted that though this was his corvette, and he was a moth, it was impossible to not be somewhat frightened by the knowledge of the Dark One's title of Sith Lord, his invisible weapon of the Force, and his blood-red lightsaber. He knew this was a test, and fear turned into odd fascination as he watched Vader nervously or angrily pacing, supervising the loading of a large black sphere into the cargo bay of the Carrion Spike. When it bumped into a wall, Vader nearly killed an old Clone Wars vet, Sergeant Crest, an original batch clone trooper that commanded the stormtroopers. Tarkin could not figure out what purpose this thing served, hypothesizing everything from a cyborg toilet to healing chamber to simply a place where Vader could strip off his mechanical suit. Whatever it was, he was not asked or informed about this being placed in his personal ship, not even when Vader ordered the men to link it to the ship's power system. The mission that follows would bring the Sith and Moth closer than before, as they hunt down the greatest threat to the Empire to date, a threat that would prove to be just one part of a larger movement of rebellion that Tarkin would spend the rest of his days suppressing. When Tarkin reached Mercana, he set the Carrion Spike down in an old Corporate Alliance airstrip. As Tarkin and Vader disembarked, a unit of stormtroopers from a low-altitude Imperial transport greeted them, ready to serve as escorts. Leaving the crew and four stormtroopers, including Sergeant Crest, behind, Tarkin, Vader, and the rest of the stormtroopers headed to the deserted med center where the communications equipment was reportedly found. At the site, Tarkin had a hunch that the devices had been intentionally left there. He deduced that the individual who found the equipment probably used parts of it to fabricate the fake distress signal sent to Sentinel Base. Vader then pushed to interrogate the ISB informant, who first brought the find to their attention. Later, within the Imperial base, Tarkin and Vader conferred with the Imperial ambassador and the Korovar ISB representative, Rakchia. Under questioning, Rakchia confessed that he hadn't personally found the communication stash, but was verifying a report from his ISB superior on Coruscant, a revelation that took Tarkin aback. However, before he could probe deeper, Sergeant Crest asked about a hollow transmission directing him to the Med Center, a message Tarkin had not sent. Tarkin quickly pieced together that the insurgents, who had previously sent a deceptive hollow vid to Sentinel Base, were likely trying to divert the stormtroopers from the Carrion Spike. When Crest and his team lost contact with the Carrion Spike and raced back to the airstrip, a cold sweat would overtake them, as they saw that the ship had been hijacked, and two stormtroopers, the captain and communications chief, lay dead. The pursuit intensified as the rebels, with the stolen Carrion Spike, continued their attacks on Imperial outposts and relayed the footage for all to see. Tarkin, with Vader by his side in the Parsec Predator, relentlessly followed the insurgents every move. The theft of the Carrion Spike wasn't just an attack on the Empire, but it was personal for Tarkin. However, this chase was not without its challenges. The Rebels employed advanced stealth technology, that state-of-the-art equipment on the Carrion Spike, in order to elude the clutches of the Empire and the Spike's owner. This, combined with their intimate knowledge of the Outer Rim territories, made them formidable opponents. While Vader's connection to the Force and his intuition around the location of his meditation chamber, which was still inside of the Carrion Spike, did help them track it across the galaxy. But even with this, it became evident that they needed more intel on the Rebels' intentions and next moves. Tarkin decided to use his vast intelligent network to uncover any secrets or informants within the Empire who might be aiding these insurgents. Meanwhile, the wider implications of the theft weighed heavily on Tarkin's mind. The insurgent strategy of broadcasting these attacks eroded the image of an invincible empire, and he knew this could inspire others to rebel. This not only made the retrieval of the Carrion Spike a priority, but also the complete annihilation of Teller's rebel cell and all his supporters. The Parsec Predator journeyed through the star systems, battles, and skirmishes. With each encounter, the rebels' intentions became clearer, as did the growing rift within the Empire. The stolen ship became more than just a vessel, it was a symbol. And for as much as he loved this ship, one that he personally tailored to his own needs, Tarkin knew that he would have to destroy that symbol to maintain the Empire's dominance. 
The invader watched as the Galadran station's defenses scrambled in response to the cloaked Carrion Spikes attacks. The Air C-170s and V-Wings launched in rapid succession, their engines roaring to life as they zipped into space, leaving bright trails behind. The ensuing space dogfight was a testament to the prowess of Imperial training versus the guile of rebels, who for the first time had the technological upper hand. Amidst the frenzied exchange of fire, a moment of truth arrived. A brilliant flash lit the dark void as the Predator's particle beams found their mark, causing a temporary illumination of the Carrion Spike silhouette, a momentary victory for these Imperials. Yet the insurgents had not spent their time idly. From the Carrion Spike, a barrage of shots with its pintle guns lashed out, striking the Predator critically. The impact jolted Tarkin in his seat, alarms blaring as systems malfunctioned and lights flickered. With their ship disabled, Tarkin and Vader could only watch as the Carrion Spike took advantage of the situation, making its escape towards the outer reaches of the Galadran system. In the cold vastness of space, the battle had ended, at least for now. The game of intergalactic chess between the Empire and Insurgents had only intensified, and the next move was anyone's guess. While awaiting a shuttle evac from Galadran Station, Tarkin utilized the station's navigation systems to determine all potential exit routes. Analyzing a compilation of nearby star systems with Imperial assets, it dawned on Tarkin that the Rebels intended to target these facilities using the Carrion Spike. After conferring with Lord Vader about the potential insurgent targets, he directed the Colonel of Galadran Station to command the Imperial RM Facility 4 Deep Dock to send the Venator-class Star Destroyer Liberator to Nam Chorios, a site of an Imperial prison and mining operation. Not long after, they discovered the insurgents had discarded Vader's meditation chamber and obliterated Galadran's hyperspace marker, making them no longer trackable through this Force connection and making their hyper route untraceable. Not only are they conversant with the Carrion Spike's instruments, they are also well acquainted with Imperial procedure. The self-styled commander looks every bit an officer, and he used code cylinders to requisition the fuel cells. He looked up at Vader. Some of the Empire's own? The Emperor has limited patience for puzzles, Governor. Whoever they are, we need to put an end to their game. Amidst the halls of the Liberator, news of the Insurgents' audacious attack on Tag Co's facilities reached Tarkin and Vader. This wasn't just any rebellious act, but a well-coordinated strike against the Empire's resources. With the House of Tag connected to several important Imperials, and their food distribution, mining, and weapons operations were crucial elements in the Imperial War Machine. The subsequent Holovid broadcasts further underscored the Rebels' intent to challenge the Empire's dominance, not only through destruction, but in the realm of public perception. The Outer Systems, always a cauldron of discontent, were abuzz with whispers of these daring raids. Vice Admirals Rancet and Screed recognized the growing threat, and with the gravity of the situation, managed to sway the Emperor's hand. As a result, Imperial Navy ships were positioned to guard vulnerable Imperial installations, especially along critical galactic trade routes like the Perlimian Trade Route and Hydean Way. The Liberator, now positioned at Ord Cestus, was a formidable symbol of the Empire's intent to squash any new uprisings, but it also made clear just how much of an impact Birch Teller's gang was having. When Vader's distinctive Black Eta II Actis class light interceptor docked, an urgent meeting ensued between him and Tarkin. Poring over hollow maps and intelligence reports, Tarkin shared his belief that the rebels who hijacked the Carrion Spike might have ties with the mysterious warship at Sentinel Base. The timing of the Galadran Station raid, especially with the recent exit of a Victory class Star Destroyer, was too precise to be coincidental. Vader concurred and drew attention to the Mercana communications cache, suggesting a deeper conspiracy. And Tarkin, always the one for meticulous planning, did have a trick up his sleeve. The hidden Paralyte Tracker. And since it had been pinged, they were able to analyze Carrion Spike's movements, and Tarkin was faced with two potential refueling points. While Gromus seemed a logical choice, Tarkin's season intuition suggested otherwise. He believed the Rebels would opt for Findar, hoping to avoid the Empire's increased security. The skies of Findar were set alight with energy bursts, flame, and molten durasteel, as Imperial forces descended upon the Carrion Spike. Tarkin's meticulous planning and prediction had led them to this pivotal moment. With the piercing roar of engines and distinctive hum of Lord Vader's interceptor, the two Imperial leaders zoomed into battle, with Tarkin adopting the call sign Yellow 2. The spectacle of Tarkin, typically a commander from the bridge, piloting the small V-Wing in the thick of battle, showcased his determination to retrieve the stolen Corvette. Every maneuver, every sharp turn, was an intricate dance of strategy and precision. Lord Vader, with his piloting prowess, was able to slice through space with unmatched agility. 
However, these insurgents were no pushovers. Their familiarity with Imperial protocols and procedure was evident. The audacity to impersonate Commander Abel Assal indicated a deep-seated understanding and perhaps internal assistance. A decision to avoid Gromas, as Vader pointed out, hinted at an informant within the Empire's ranks, someone who tipped them off to those increased security measures. As Tarkin's plan unfolded, the Imperials aimed to neutralize the Carrion Spike's deflector shields. The V-Wings swarmed around the Corvette like hornets, employing hit-and-run tactics, trying to force the ship into a vulnerable position. Tarkin's secondary strategy focused on the hyperdrive generator, hoping to make sure the ship was not able to flee. But the insurgents were clever, utilizing the tanker as both a shield and as a hindrance for Imperials, forcing the V-Wings and Interceptors to constantly adjust their strategies. The unexpected involvement of the tanker's ARC-170 Starfighters added another level of complexity. Tarkin's plea to the Fendrian Administrator went unheeded, with the latter determined to defend his assets. And just as Tarkin had worried, the increased volume of fire from all these Starfighters played right into the insurgents' hands. In the aftermath of the explosion, the vast emptiness of space above Findar was pierced only by the distant stars and floating debris from the tanker and fallen starfighters. The enemy had demonstrated their cunning once again, using subterfuge and well-placed explosives to create chaos among the Imperial ranks. Aboard the Goliath, Tarkin and Vader regrouped. The weight of the lost fighters and the destruction of the tanker weighed heavily on Tarkin's shoulders. Meeting with Findar's planetary leadership, discussions revolved around the accountability for the destruction. Despite being a seasoned strategist, Tarkin couldn't shake off the feeling of having been played by these insurgents. His invader's presence had been used as pawns to draw the Imperial fleet into a deadly trap. The revelation of a concealed explosive within a spent fuel cell further confirmed the meticulous planning of the rebels. This was no impulsive act but a well-coordinated effort, but with more evidence toward inside help, with the hope of eliminating both Tarkin and Vader, key figures in the Empire's hierarchy, showed the daring ambition of these rebels that truly thought they could overthrow the Emperor. And they released yet another Holovid broadcast, taunting the Empire's inability to capture them. Their propaganda game was strong, with each broadcast igniting sparks of rebellion in the souls of people across the entire galaxy. But amidst the chaos, a lead emerged. Intelligence indicated that the Carrion Spike was spotted near Thustra, an Aquarius in the expansion region. With this new information, Tarkin was determined not to let the insurgents elude him any longer, and this time with a renewed vigor and thirst for justice. As events unfolded in the Obra Sky system, it became apparent that Tarkin and his forces were once again entangled in another ruse. Birch Teller's strategic use of misinformation and decoys had gotten even better with all this experience, and the deployment of the Reticent to Obra Sky was a masterful touch, diverting significant Imperial firepower and resources to chase shadows. From the bridge of the Executrix, Tarkin observed this unfolding situation, attempting to piece together the enemy's plans and anticipate their next move. But things quickly spiraled out of control with the malfunction of the immobilizer's gravity well projectors. The sheer gravitational forces exerted by the malfunctioning interdictor ship wreaked havoc on nearby vessels. A catastrophic collision between the Stellar Vista and the Detainer CC-2200 was a grim reminder of the cost of this ongoing conflict, with over a thousand lives lost. The urgency and tension on the bridge were palpable. Directing frigates to aid the stricken luxury liner and negate the disruptive interdiction field were the crucial first steps. The various civilian vessels caught in the chaos were next on his agenda, as Tarkin aimed to maintain order and ensure no potential insurgent actors slipped through. Lord Vader, on his picket ship, was prepared for boarding action, waiting for Tarkin's command. But with the situation rapidly evolving, priorities shifted from the insurgent hunt to damage control and civilian safety. The Lux 400 yacht Truant's desperate attempt to flee didn't go unnoticed by Tarkin. His stern command to annihilate the suspected smuggling vessel highlighted his no-nonsense approach to maintaining order amidst the chaos. With the space around Ober Sky filled with a mismatch of civilian, commercial, and Imperial vessels, he was adamant about asserting Imperial dominance and showing that the Empire stood for order and safety. But amidst the tangle of starships and flashing alarms, the elusive Carrion Spike remained conspicuously absent. Both Tarkin and Vader were astute enough to deduce that the events unfolding were likely another subterfuge by the insurgents to divert their attention. However, the reticence rather timely appearance from hyperspace piqued Tarkin's interest. Aboard this freighter, they hoped to find some link or clue that might lead them closer to the insurgents. Interrogating the core of our captain brought to light the involvement of the broker Knots. While the captain's claims seemed to appease Tarkin momentarily, Lord Vader, with his deep intuition and more forceful methods, felt there was more to uncover. The Dark Lord's insistence on a thorough investigation spoke volumes about his trust, or lack thereof, certain that some Imperials had become traitors. 
Aboard the massive and technologically advanced Executrix, Tarkin processed the stream of information coming in. The successful defense of the Imperial facility in the Noane system was a rare moment of relief in this cat and mouse chase, validating Vice Admiral Rancid's protective measures. While internal Imperial politics hinted at Rancid's ascendancy and possible discontent with Tarkin, Vader was quick to allay such fears. The Sith Lord's reassurance was twofold. He believed the Emperor was maneuvering to free Tarkin from ancillary duties to focus on insurgents, and Vader's own trust in Tarkin's capabilities remained unshaken. The confession about naval intelligence's tip-off added another layer to the investigation, suggesting a deeper reach of the insurgents into the very heart of the Empire. Tarkin's digging into the Imperial Hollow Net began to reveal a clearer picture. The insurgents were not just a random assembly of rebels, but a coalition bound by past traumas. Antar Atrocity, a dark blemish in the annals of the Empire, was the binding thread. Tarkin's realization that many of the insurgents had direct ties to Antar IV, either having witnessed or survived its horrors, provided crucial context to their next actions. Their motivations were deeply personal. However, the revelation that Birch Teller, the mastermind behind their current woes, had been operating under their noses as Commander LaSalle was particularly jarring to Tarkin. Furthermore, Tarkin's prior role at Desolation Station added another dimension to his capabilities and intimate knowledge of Imperial operations. The situation around the dissidents and their alleged plot against the Imperial Academy on Corrida thickened. Vice Admiral Rancid's involvement and his reported task force raised suspicions, especially given the intricate web of intelligence and counterintelligence that Tarkin and Vader had been investigating. The quiet moments aboard the shuttle offered a brief reprieve from the ongoing strategizing, allowing for some personal anecdotes. Tarkin's tale of his adolescent face-off with the marauding Veermox was not merely a childhood memory, but a testament to his warrior mindset, even in his youth, revealing that he named his prized corvette Carrie and Spike after such a pivotal moment in his life, underscoring just how significant this ship was to him. Vader's insight into this story, reflecting on leadership and the dangers of internal discord, was a parallel to the ongoing dynamics within the Empire itself, and among those testing the waters to see if they would join in rebellion. Vader's subsequent confrontation with Vice Admiral Rancid aboard the Conquest was charged with tension. The Dark Lord's formidable presence, combined with the mounting evidence of Rancid's duplicity, despite orders to capture the Carrion Spike, when they had the opportunity, Rancid attempted to destroy it to hide his ties to the insurgency, and this would be the final nail in his coffin. Vader's method of execution was not just a demonstration of the Sith Lord's ruthlessness, but symbolic as well. Forcing Rancid into his own escape pod, firing himself out away from his secular class, and told to use his calm to give the order to his own men to open fire. The message was clear. Betrayal of the Empire would not be tolerated, especially at such high levels of command. And as the escape pod exploded, extinguishing Rancid's treacherous life, the words, Governor Tarkin sends his regards, spoken by the deep cyborg voice of Vader, was the last thing Rancid would hear over the comms. Sealing the fate of yet another individual caught in the intricate dance of power, betrayal, and retribution in the Emperor's new order. But the next incident would be near the Gulf of Tatooine. The barren moon served as a backdrop to a fierce skirmish that saw the Imperial might of Tarkin's command pit against Birch Teller and his band of insurgents. The ambush on the Imperial convoy was strategic, aiming a blow at the very heart of the Empire's grand project, the Death Star. Teller's assembled force, a motley collection of former Separatist assets, droid fighters, and modified starfighters, showcased their intense commitment to their cause. Amidst the swirling chaos of laser fire, exploding ships, and agile maneuvers, Tarkin's strategic acumen took charge. Instructing the V-Wings from the Executrix to focus on the larger threats of the frigate and carrier, Tarkin's approach was methodical, designed to dismantle the insurgents' chain of command. His audacious move to bring the imposing Star Destroyer directly into the fray was classic Tarkin, direct, intimidating, and powerful. The resulting destruction of the Nebulon B frigate was meant as a message to all present of just how powerful these new ISDs were. However, the main prize was Teller's warship. The destruction of its systems, especially the master control computer, highlighted Tarkin's knowledge of the Separatist tech and its Achilles heel. The immediate incapacitation of the droid fighters turned the tide of battle in the Empire's favor. The aftermath bore the hallmarks of Tarkin's ruthlessness and disdain for these rebels. As stormtroopers combed through the damaged enemy flagship, apprehending insurgent leaders, Tarkin's interactions showcased his nature, cold, calculating, and confident. The captured Knots, who remained silent in the face of Tarkin's provocation, and the defiant Anor Fair, with her brash outbursts and subsequent assault by a stormtrooper, painted a vivid picture of these escalating tensions. With Tarkin vowing to extract information from the captives, the stage was set for further conflict, both physical and ideological. The galaxy's intricate power play was evolving, 
bringing countless systems into direct contact with the destruction caused by rebels and the powerful Iron Fist of the Emperor. With Tarkin's elevation to the powerful and unprecedented position of Grand Moth, the Empire's grip on the galaxy tightened even further. The role was not just a title, it was a clear statement from the Emperor about who held significant sway in the vastness of this galaxy. And trusting Tarkin with oversight of the Outer Rim territories was both a reward and a strategic move, ensuring that this critical region was under the thumb of one of the Emperor's most loyal and competent officers. With the looming Death Star project under Tarkin's purview, his influence was undeniable. Tarkin's approach to leadership was never passive. His media engagements, where he elaborated on his vision of the galaxy, became widely discussed. The media's branding of these statements as the Tarkin Doctrine showcased his philosophy of unwavering imperial strength and control. This doctrine reinforced the Empire's narrative of order, peace, and stability through might and dominance. Engaging with senators from various star systems was also a strategic move, while many might have seen the benefit of reporting directly to Tarkin rather than navigating the labyrinthine bureaucracy of the Empire. These meetings were not to save them time, they served as a way to look directly into your eyes, as he provided stark reminders of his expectations and the consequences of defiance. Beyond the political landscape, Tarkin's interactions with military and intelligence chiefs signified his integrated approach. The safety and secrecy of the Death Star project was paramount, and he wasted no time in fortifying its locations. Being a meticulous leader, always thinking several steps ahead and ensuring the Empire's interests were safeguarded at every turn. The galaxy was shifting, and at the heart of this change was Grand Moff Tarkin, wielding physical power, shaping the narrative in the media, and setting the stage for an era of Imperial dominance. Upon concluding his duties on Coruscant, Tarkin made his way back to his home planet, Ariadu, aboard his gleaming new flagship, the Executrix. The majestic Star Destroyer signaled his elevated status, and the formidable entourage of 32 Stormtroopers further emphasized his importance, and he would receive a hometown hero's welcome at Felnar Spaceport. Iridu City erupted in festivities, between familial visits and media engagements, Tarkin soaked in the admiration. The key to the city, awarded by a relative serving as the local governor, and a statue in his honor further solidified his legendary status among his people. And during the visit to his carrion spike, a familiar face awaited him, his uncle Jova. Jova informed Tarkin of Birch Teller's recent pursuits, but then surprisingly shifted to telling him that Teller had been trapped in a pit. With a touch of familiar warmth, Jova conveyed his pride in Tarkin's achievements, and Tarkin expressed his gratitude for his uncle's guidance over all these years. But he had to go see it for himself, and thus long-awaited face-off with Birch Teller. Looking down into the pit, he saw defiance in Teller's eyes, as the man confessed his intent to murder Tarkin. Their conversation ventured into the realm of Imperial politics, with Teller asking about the Empire's clandestine operations on Geonosis. Tarkin, with characteristic aloofness, declined to divulge any specifics, and aware of the dangers lurking in the Carrion Plateau, Tarkin extended a challenge to Teller escape the pit with his injured ankle, and earn his freedom. Teller spurned Tarkin's offer, predicting a grim fate for the moth instead, and as Tarkin bade a cold farewell to his foe, he and Jova discussed the bleak odds of Teller surviving in this perilous plateau. Though of course it would have been pragmatic to end the rebel's life here, the warrior in him thought this end was just too pathetic. And besides, putting down these insurrectionists was partly why he was now a grand moth. After leaving Iriadu, Tarkin made his way to the Death Star's development location orbiting Geonosis, which was under the protection of four Star Destroyers and an additional eight frigates. At this juncture, workers were fitting the station with hyperdrive components, yet it could not yet achieve hyperspace travel. Upon inspecting the colossal structure, Tarkin instructed the activation of the Death Star's sublight engines. This behemoth then set course from Geonosis into the vast expanse of space, only to eventually return for further assembly. Although Tarkin's authority over the Death Star grew, he deliberately kept a certain detachment from the project. This strategic distance enabled him to pin any hitches in the project on Krennic. This maneuvering ensured that once completed, Tarkin could assert full command over the Death Star and sideline Krennic with a long list of shortcomings over the project's development. After the events of the Moncala occupation, Vader approached Tarkin regarding a debt that he felt he owed the Grand Moff for his efforts in capturing Lee Char. Unexpectedly, Vader's repayment request was for Tarkin to hunt him down, even suggesting lethal measures if necessary. Puzzled at first, Tarkin eventually inferred that Vader, having exterminated most of the Jedi, yearned for a genuine challenge. Honored to be selected for this unique task, Tarkin assembled a team of the galaxy's most elite hunters. The chosen hunting ground was Chandar's Folly. Equipped with knowledge of Vader's formidable combat skills, Tarkin provided his hunters with slug throwers and flamethrowers to negate Vader's ability to deflect projectiles. 
On the hunt's second day, they cornered Vader within the grove of Thurian trees, assaulting him with torrents of flames. Watching Vader momentarily falter, Tarkin thought he detected a flicker of vulnerability. But that moment was fleeting, as Vader retaliated fiercely, annihilating his attackers. Vader's presence was easy to trace as he left conspicuous signs during his movements, but it was soon clear that this was intentional. Vader would periodically ambush the hunters, testing them, and Tarkin knew that Vader's lightsaber was his primary weapon. After multiple attempts and the loss of several men, one of the hunters, named 81, succeeded in disarming Vader using a grappling wire. Without his saber, Vader's tactics shifted and his rage intensified. An angry opponent was generally more vulnerable, but Tarkin acknowledged this principle didn't hold true for Vader. And in a subsequent encounter, despite being shot multiple times, Vader got within arm's reach of five hunters. From a distant vantage point, Tarkin observed Vader unleash his force abilities, instantly killing two of the hunters. Recognizing Vader's considerable prowess, Tarkin sensed the hunt might be concluding, yet he also realized Vader's determination to retrieve his lightsaber meant that as long as they pursued him, Vader would reciprocate, turning the hunt into a game of cat and mouse. The hunt on Chandar's Folly reached its ninth day, with Tarkin's group dwindling to a mere seven hunters. One morning, Sissian, a Chadra fan member of Tarkin's team, sighted Vader at a distance, distinctively donning the hide of a Valeth, the planet's apex predator. Trusting in Sissian and his grandfather's acute hearing, Tarkin commanded his team into a crystal ravine. Vader's echoing breath within the ravine, a sort of sonic weapon of fear on its own, became challenging to pinpoint. Without warning, Vader ambushed them, unleashing the force and causing casualties among Tarkin's already diminished team. The survivors fled to the Stormlands, an open area offering them a strategic advantage. Setting up camp, they hoped to detect Vader by his mechanical breathing. The Sith Lord, foreseeing this, momentarily turned off his respirator, thus attacking silently and taking down even more of Tarkin's team. Upon reclaiming his lightsaber through the Force, Vader quickly dispatched the last of the hunters. Tarkin, realizing the inevitable outcome, kneeled, seemingly awaiting his end. But nature, his homeworld, had its own plans. A bolt of lightning struck Vader, incapacitating but not killing him. This area was called the Stormlands for good reason, and Tarkin knew that the lightning was his only hope though it could have easily struck him as well. And Tarkin, seizing on the unexpected reprieve, called in the carrion spike for extraction. As he waited by the felled Vader, the ship descended, and its shields flashing as they deflected the frequent lightning strikes of the Stormland. Breaking the tense silence, Tarkin mused aloud about Vader, hoping the Sith garnered whatever he sought from this hunt. Yet as Tarkin's corvette touched down, Vader's hand gave a sudden jerk, and Tarkin felt the familiar and terrifying grip of the Force around his throat. It was a potent reminder of Vader's supremacy. Eventually, the grip loosened, and the two adversaries lay side by side, pondering the implications of this duel and the future dynamics of their uneasy alliance. Tarkin's governance in the Outer Rim reflected the Empire's modus operandi of extracting maximum utility from its territories, even if it meant disrupting the lives of its citizens. His decision to forcefully evict farmers from their ancestral lands on Lothal was indicative of this approach. The purpose was singular, to exploit the planet's resources for imperial ambitions. The farmers, whose lives were turned upside down by this decision, ended up in resettlement camps, with Camp 43 being bitterly referred to as Tarkin Town. However, Tarkin's visits to such sites weren't restricted to Lothal. An incident on his home planet of Eriadu further showcased his determination to crush any hint of rebellion. Visiting an air scrubber farm that had recently suffered a rebel attack, Tarkin interacted with the farm's manager, who had lost his daughter in this strike. While the manager was visibly distressed, his son was seemingly enamored by the might and order of Tarkin's accompanying stormtroopers. This moment subtly emphasized the dichotomous impact of the Empire on its subjects. While some saw oppressors, others saw virtue, and it was often innocent civilians caught in between. After the Empire seized control of Savuka in 11 BBY, Tarkin embarked on an inspection tour of the planet. Assured by a high-ranking officer that the local populace was under control, Tarkin opted to go by land and between key locations. However, while en route to the planetary garrison, the final stop of his tour, his Imperial troop transport came under attack. Native Savukans mounted on Kivora beasts forced the transport into a marshy area. As Tarkin was freeing himself from his seat, another attack nearly flipped them. And displaying his characteristic decisiveness, Tarkin quickly maneuvered the vehicle out of the danger zone, even as he had to counteract one of the beasts directly. Imperial speeder bikes soon surrounded him, escorting the beleaguered transport safely to the garrison. And once he arrived, Tarkin took the base commander to task, questioning the lack of adequate troops along the route. The commander explained that while they had enough personnel, there was a glaring shortfall in the supply of stormtrooper armor. This revelation took Tarkin aback, who had been under the impression that the recruitment process was thriving. The commander further explained that while the manpower wasn't the concern, it was the actual distribution of equipment that was severely lacking. 
Acknowledging this systemic flaw, Tarkin stated that the blame rested on a few individuals within the system, and after the discussion, he promptly summoned his shuttle and retired to refresh and change his attire. On Gilvanin, Tarkin was determined to uncover the root causes of this slowed armor production, believing there might be issues beyond the surface level inefficiencies that Vidian might highlight. Vidian's reputation was one of efficiency, but Tarkin knew that numbers and immediate results often did not address underlying problems. And as they toured the Quelton fabrication factory, Tarkin observed Vidian's interactions with Quelton, noting the former's attempts to provide solutions that would quickly boost productivity without accounting for long-term sustainability. Tarkin's suspicions were confirmed when Quelton pushed for a more pushed for a more in-depth answer, pointed to labor unrest at the Kladak factory as a primary culprit for the slow production. Strikes and labor disagreements usually indicated deeper systemic issues, and Tarkin realized that it was Vidian's short-sightedness that was causing all these problems. Ever the pragmatist, Vidian suggested a crackdown on the protesting workers, but Tarkin took a moment to reflect. He realized that the key to understanding this problem lay not just with the numbers and processes, but in the sentiments and conditions of the people involved. And with Tarkin prompting further investigation, they came to realize that some workers at Clad Tech were secretly siphoning off some of the armor components and selling them on the black market for a hefty price. This underground operation not only hampered production, but threatened the security and integrity of the Imperial's military supply chain. This revelation, while alarming, offered an opportunity for Tarkin and Vidian to collaborate effectively. Tarkin believed that this was an indication of the workers' dissatisfaction and desperation which led them to this crime, while Vidian saw it purely as an inefficiency, something that just needed to be stomped out. Together they decided on a two-pronged approach. Tarkin would address the workers, hoping to resolve the underlying issues and win their loyalty, while Vidian would streamline the production process to reduce potential points of theft and sabotage. When Tarkin addressed the workers, he acknowledged their grievances, but also underscored the importance of their work in bringing about the Empire's vision of a secure and prosperous galaxy. Offering them better working conditions and incentives, Tarkin aimed to bring them back into the fold of the Empire, loyal and committed. Vidian, in the meantime, implemented automated systems and had tighter security checks, ensuring that the armor components could not be diverted again. Though the duo had different ways of handling the situation, together they brought about a positive change, restoring the factory's production rates and instilling a sense of pride and duty in the workers. The subsequent weeks saw an upsurge in armor production, establishing Gilvanin as a key contributor to the Imperial military supply chain. With the planet now under strict Imperial oversight, any form of dissent was crushed swiftly. The factories ran with the singular purpose of churning out Stormtrooper armor, and the days when they were influenced by individualistic ideals seemed like a distant memory. Vidian's management, through Lt. Aviri Chalice, further streamlined this production process. The factories were equipped with the latest tech, ensuring minimal wastage and maximum output. Now well aware of the consequences of dissent, worked diligently, and any talk of strikes or sabotage was a taboo. And the memory of Quelton's treachery and subsequent death served as a grim reminder of the cost of defiance. Meanwhile, Tarkin's gesture of rewarding Vidian with a Star Destroyer emphasized the value the Empire placed on loyalty and efficiency. Captain Sloan, eager to prove her worth and uphold the tenets of the Empire, took the helm of Vidian's new ship, and under her leadership, the Star Destroyer quickly made a name for itself as an indomitable force in the Imperial fleet. Her collaboration with Vidian ensured that any threats to the Empire's objectives in the region were dealt with swiftly and decisively. Tarkin's interactions with both Vidian and Sloan on Gilvanin were indicative of his talent for strategy and diplomacy. He not only restored the Stormtrooper armor supply chain, but also ensured that any traces of rebellion on the planet were squashed, and he also made a great reputation for himself, letting Vidian stay as the hard disciplinarian and paint himself as an ally of the workers. Months later, the Outer Rim world of Jalukan was annexed, and Tarkin's handling of the situation exemplified his multifaceted approach to governance. While he was known for his ruthlessness, he was also adept at using subtler tactics, recognizing the potential advantages of influencing the younger generation. By fostering a sense of admiration among the youth, he aimed to mold future Imperial loyalists who would serve the Empire willingly, zealously. In the months that followed, the tale of Tarkin's encounter with Kryl and Ri became well known among the citizens of Jalukan, serving both as a beacon of hope and stark reminder of the Empire's reach. Parents began to see the Empire as not just a governing force, but as a pathway for their children's success. This dual narrative, the promise of opportunity on one hand, and the threat of swift retribution on the other, became central to Tarkin's governance strategy in the Outer Rim. Young Piet, meanwhile, learned a valuable lesson that day about the nuanced nature of power and influence. Tarkin's methods left a lasting impression on him, and he began to adapt a similar style of leadership as he climbed the ranks of the Imperial Navy. Yet for all the strides the Empire made in winning the hearts and minds of people, there remained pockets of resistance throughout the Outer Rim. 
These dissenters, often fueled by memories of a time before the Empire's dominance, became the seeds of what would eventually grow into the Rebel Alliance. And while Tarkin's influence was undeniable, the Empire's growing reach would also lead to an equally strong backlash from those who valued freedom over the authoritarian security the Empire offered. And while on Coruscant, Tarkin had an appointment with Orinda Price, believed to be a representative of the advocacy group Higher Skies. However, upon her arrival, Price clarified that she was there for personal reasons and not on behalf of the group. Eager to establish trust, Price handed Tarkin a data card. Though he initially feared it contained a malicious program meant to extract his files, Price showed him another card, saying that this was the one she had been directed to hand over, which did in fact contain virus software. And puzzled by her honesty, Tarkin wanted to learn more. Instead of a direct response, Price urged Tarkin to examine the data on that first card, which disclosed confidential information about top Imperial politicians. This info had been surreptitiously acquired through similar deceptive programs. In recognizing some of the data, but startled by other revelations, Tarkin became concerned about Higher Sky's extensive intelligence gathering and technological prowess. Price then expressed her suspicion that Higher Skies might have ties with rebel factions. Addressing his concerns, Price described how she had cleverly deployed a dual-function program to collect the data. It shared a portion with her superiors to maintain her cover, but also allowed her a complete extraction for her own purposes, which she always intended to present to Tarkin. Elaborating further, she divulged that two allies had aided her. ISB Colonel Yularen had helped with the technical aspects, and Naval Commander Thrawn had pointed her towards Tarkin. Though initially skeptical of Price dropping the names of two of the most well-known and influential officers, Tarkin was ultimately convinced of her genuineness when she emphasized that her end game was to have him as an ally. Tarkin's memory of the Chiss Thrawn was revived. He remembered the aliens' unprecedented progress through the Imperial Navy's ranks, which had been controversial among the High Command. Delving into the specifics, Tarkin asked Price what her allies, particularly Thrawn, sought in return for all this assistance. Price explained that while Yularen hoped to utilize the data for an ISB investigation, Thrawn sought a promotion for his protege, who was unjustly sidelined due to political spite from High Command. Tarkin's interest peaked further when Price mentioned that Moff Gotti, a personal rival of Tarkin's, was behind the Ensign's stagnation, when she unveiled another layer to her intel, producing a conversation recording between herself and Gotti. Gotti's evident ambition to sideline Tarkin was exposed. Sensing an opportunity for strategic alliance, Tarkin asked Price about her own aspirations. Her ambition was revealed to be relatively simple, yet highly strategic. She aimed to become the governor of Lothal. And Tarkin, surprised by her modesty, noted that while her intel was invaluable, it might not be sufficient for such a position. Anticipating this, she presented another data card, and it was a treasure trove of data on Lothal ranging from hidden mining sites to in-depth societal structures, all tailored to ensure the Empire's seamless integration into the planet. Recognizing the value of the information and appreciating the meticulous groundwork Price had laid, Tarkin conveyed that the governor's role was soon to be vacant. However, Lothal's current senator had had his eyes on the position. Still, Tarkin, always the strategist, saw potential in Price as an insider to spy on other influential figures in the Empire. In return for her commitment to this new role, Tarkin provisionally granted her the title of Acting Governorship of Lothal, with a promise to solidify her position in the near future. The catch was that Price would have an extended stay on Coruscant, serving as Tarkin's informant, an arrangement Price found agreeable, proving her innate ability to play the long game. The two then sealed their agreement, marking the beginning of a mutually beneficial relationship. And after this, these machinations unfolded seamlessly. Ilaren, using the information Price provided, swiftly apprehended the rebels associated with the Higher Skies group. And true to his word, Tarkin bestowed upon Price the coveted title of governor, making her a major figure in the Empire's hierarchy. With another task in mind, Tarkin called upon Thrawn and his aide Vanto. In a grand and ceremonious manner, Vanto was elevated to the rank of Lieutenant Commander, while Thrawn was advanced to Commodore. As an added gesture of goodwill, Thrawn was also awarded a captainship of the formidable Imperial-class Star Destroyer Chimera. Their achievements and promotions were not just a reward for their service, but a clear indication of Tarkin's influence and favor. Following the ceremony, Tarkin took a moment to congratulate both officers, ensuring that Price's gratitude was also conveyed. The intricacies of their collaboration and political maneuvers led to Tarkin extending an invitation to Price to visit his homeworld of Ariadu, where he would further solidify their alliance. However, Tarkin's rise and consolidation of power did not come without challenges. Tarkin found himself in possession of a coveted Virilix urn, an artifact of significance to the formidable gangster Jabba the Hutt. This urn was believed to house the remains of Crestral Dinarin, a figure Jabba loathed immensely. After wrestling control of this artifact from mercenaries, Tarkin placed it in the secure confines of his Coruscant office. 
A mysterious droid, professing to be a messenger from the Emperor, appeared before Tarkin with grave news. The droid alleged that Grand Vizier Masamita was conspiring against the Emperor and intending to assassinate him. Deciding that such grave information warranted a personal audience with the Emperor, Tarkin, surrounded by his formidable squad of death troopers, left for the Imperial Palace. But this departure created an opportunity. The droid's plot worked, and he was able to pilfer the prized urn from Tarkin's office, removing a potential vector of influence Tarkin could have had with Jabba. In the wake of the Empire's expanding dominance, resistance began to stir in the form of localized rebel cells. One such cell on Lothal, reputedly led by a Jedi, proved particularly thorny for the Empire. Tarkin, ever focused on ensuring the effectiveness of the Imperial regime, called upon Governor Price, holding her accountable for the repeated failures to quell the rebels. Admiral Cassius Constantine, along with others, had been woefully ineffective in neutralizing this particular threat. And while Price strategized her next move, Tarkin opted for a hands-on approach, given the consistent shortcomings of the Academy of Young Imperials on Lothal, which the rebels had exploited time and time again. Tarkin dispatched Assessor Patola to conduct an audit of the Academy's functioning under Commandant Oresco. Her findings, communicated via hologram, painted a bleak picture of laxity and complacency, leading Tarkin to visit Lothal in person to handle the situation. Tarkin's grand entry was aboard the Sovereign, a testament to his power and authority. The Grand Inquisitor, Minister Makath Tua, and Agent Callus received him. Tua, who was temporarily overseeing Lothal's assets in Price's absence, faced Tarkin's disapproval for her perceived inefficiency in addressing the rebels' activities on the planet. My visit is hardly an honor, Minister. I admit I was surprised to learn you were coming. And I too have been surprised by what's been happening on your little backwater world. While she alluded to the rumored presence of a Jedi amongst the rebels, Tarkin was skeptical. The Jedi, he believed, were a wiped out relic of the past. However, the recurring failures of the Grand Inquisitor in capturing the rebels added urgency and weight to these rumors. The next day, asserting his authority and establishing a clear dominance, Tarkin claimed Callus's office as his own, a stark reminder that anyone could be supplanted by a more competent individual within this empire. He convened a meeting, gathering Commandant Oresco, Taskmaster Miles Grint, Callus, Tua, and the Grand Inquisitor to review the recent engagements with the rebels. When discussing the event, Tarkin discerned that despite several skirmishes with the rebel group, there hadn't been any Imperial casualties, and this led him to a broader understanding. The hope presented by the cell's Jedi leader that had the potential to galvanize the scattered rebel cells all across the galaxy into a single unified front, something that could pose a legitimate threat to the Empire. Oresco and Grint's ineptitude only exacerbated this issue. To address this and send a chilling message about the consequences of failure, Tarkin gave a plain and subtle order to the Grand Inquisitor to execute these two officers in a cold and efficient single move. Make no mistake, from now on failure will have consequences. The lightsaber hum and the stunned silence that followed had the intended effect of letting everyone else in the room know that it could be their heads rolling next. Determined to root out and capture the elusive group known as the Spectres, Tarkin instructed Agent Callus to deploy dwarf probe droids to locations that had seen frequent rebel activities on Lothal. Not long after, Callus informed Tarkin that one of these droids near the Imperial Communications Center had been attacked and damaged. Presenting the footage of the rebels during their retreat, Tarkin astutely deduced that the communications tower would likely be their next target. However, he declined Callus's plea for the augmented security, opting instead to set a trap and let the rebels believe that they had an advantage. Handing the Grand Inquisitor an opportunity for redemption, Tarkin directed him to capture Kanan Jarrus, the alleged Jedi leading the group. At the communications tower, the Grand Inquisitor managed to best Jarrus in a duel, capturing the Jedi after he willingly surrendered to help his friends escape. And soon after these dramatic events at the tower, Tarkin, now dressed in full battle armor, arrived on the scene. He was clearly satisfied with the Grand Inquisitor's efficiency. Well done, Inquisitor. These are the results I expect. So, you are the Jedi in question? He took the captured Jedi's lightsaber as a prize, but in this interaction with Jarrus, a disturbing discovery was made. The rebels had infiltrated the tower system and were now broadcasting their resistance message to the public. Without hesitation, Tarkin ordered the immediate destruction of the tower. You do not know what it takes to win a war, but I do. With Jarrus now in Imperial custody, they boarded the Sovereign, seeking both verification of Jarrus's Jedi claims and to pull out any intelligence of a wider rebel network. Although the initial stages of the interrogation, headed by Callus, proved fruitless against the captured Jedi's defenses, the Grand Inquisitor was convinced he could break him. The Dark Jedi Hunter employed both physical and force-infused torture techniques, seeking to shatter Jarrus' dissolve. Yet despite enduring agonizing pain, the Jedi remained steadfast, refusing to yield. 
It was evident to Tarkin that Jarrus' strength and endurance were not common traits, and as Jarrus neared the brink of death, he grew increasingly convinced of his true identity as a Jedi. However, knowing it was important to keep this captive alive, Tarkin ordered a stop to all the torture. As the Grand Inquisitor began to doubt Jarrus' knowledge of a broader rebellion, Tarkin was never one to leave a stone unturned, and decided on a change of venue. He planned to transfer the captive to the notorious Fortress Vader on Mustafar, feared for its brutal interrogations, and believed to be overseen by the enigmatic and terrifying Darth Vader, knowing his Sith ally would be certain to obtain the answers he sought. The Sovereign made its position over Mustafar, joining a formation of three other Imperial Star Destroyers. Assuming command of the bridge, Tarkin was supported by Admiral Constantine, who had earlier overseen the Lothal fleet. In anticipation of potential threats, Tarkin initiated a protocol of sending periodic, all-clear messages to accompanying ships, ensuring that any missed signal would trigger an immediate response. And amidst this, the Grand Inquisitor persisted with his attempts to extract information from Jars, particularly about the elusive rebel known as Fulcrum. However, before yielding any answers, Jarrus' comrades mounted a rescue operation. Using a stolen TIE fighter packed with EMP devices, they disabled the Sovereign's primary power grid and incapacitated its contingent of stormtroopers. Responding swiftly, Tarkin ordered the ship's auxiliary power to be activated, and he assured his officers that backup was imminent, especially since the routine, all-clear signal had been interrupted. True to his word, multiple shuttles filled with stormtroopers were dispatched to the compromised Sovereign to confront these rebels. And when the rebels successfully freed Jarrus, the Grand Inquisitor made a final stand against the Jedi in the Reaction Chamber. The confrontation, however, ended in Jarrus' favor. The Inquisitor's ignited lightsaber inadvertently came into contact with the reactor's controls, triggering a catastrophic sequence that jeopardized the integrity of the entire ship. Recognizing the severity of the situation, especially with the hyperdrive compromised, an officer persuaded Tarkin to order an evacuation of the Sovereign. As chaos ensued, the rebels made their getaway into two commandeered TIE fighters. They found themselves heavily outnumbered by Imperial TIEs, but their odds changed dramatically when a fleet of blockade runners emerged from hyperspace, covering the rebels' retreat. Tarkin, evacuating on a shuttle, directed his course towards the other Star Destroyers. As he left the vicinity, one of the pilots updated him on the rebels' successful escape. This event crystallized the gravest concern harbored by Tarkin and the Empire. A widespread rebellion was forming across the galaxy. The defiance displayed by these rebels was a clear testament of their growing strength and determination, and knowing that the Lothal rebels were now part of the larger Phoenix Cell further underscored the urgency of the situation. While in Lothal, Tarkin was keenly aware of the Empire's eroding public image. The successful escape of the rebels had sent shockwaves throughout the galaxy, emboldening those opposed to the Empire. However, the presence of Darth Vader was a clear message of the lengths the Empire was willing to go to re-establish its dominance. Vader, after all, was the Emperor's enforcer, feared by many across the galaxy, and Tarkin believed that with Vader's involvement, the balance of power would shift back in the Empire's favor. On a related note, whispers regarding Commandant Brendel Hux's activities reached Tarkin. Hux's rumored secret society within the Arcanus Academy intrigued and concerned the Grand Moff. And by transferring Lieutenant Chiron, a reliable and competent officer, to Arcanus, he aimed at getting a clearer picture of what was unfolding inside the Academy. He entrusted Major Seward Cass to facilitate Chiron's mission, ensuring no bureaucratic hindrances would impede the investigation. Tarkin was determined to ensure that every corner of the Empire operated under a unified command and purpose. With the situation spiraling out of control, Tarkin's strategy took a more ruthless turn. The magnitude of the rebellion on Lothal warranted a significant response, and with Vader and Kallus at the helm, Imperial activities intensified. Imperial patrols roamed the streets, and curfews were enacted. The grip on Lothal was tighter than ever before, making it almost suffocating for the residents. Minister Tua, already under tremendous pressure, felt the weight of the Empire's wrath. Tarkin's summoning was seen as an ominous sign. Vader's mere presence on Lothal was an intimidating factor, amplifying the fear felt by many. And she realized the peril she was in, and recognizing that the Empire could turn on its own, to prevent her head from hitting the carpet, she sought assistance from the very group she had been attempting to suppress, the Rebels. Tragically, her desperate plea for help ended in her demise. Callus' cunning plan to sabotage to a ship and blame the rebels for the resultant explosion worked flawlessly. Lothal populace was fed the narrative of rebel treachery, further painting them as enemies of the state. The Imperial propaganda machine effectively turned the citizens against the rebels, casting them into the role of merciless terrorists. The ensuing public outrage and fear forced the rebels to flee Lothal, momentarily achieving what Tarkin had desired, suppressing the fire of resistance, at least for the time being. Later, in 3 BBY, as political tensions rose, Tarkin's influence and grip on the galaxy further expanded. 
His appearance at the Apprentice Legislature was not just ceremonial, it was a calculated move to identify, assess, and possibly manipulate the next generation of political leaders in the galaxy. He understood the value of molding young minds to align with the Empire's values and ambitions. The Apprentice Legislature was the perfect platform. Tarkin's interaction with Princess Leia during the reception was filled with ulterior motives. The Grand Moth was keenly aware of Organa's family influence, and his meeting with the young princess was more than just a casual exchange. It was an opportunity to gauge her intentions, ambition, and loyalty. Princess Leia's inquiry into the Revochi Ranges was not lost on Tarkin. He recognized her diplomatic skills of gathering information under the guise of innocent conversation, hinting that he was aware of her subtle tactics and would be monitoring her closely. Shortly afterward, Tarkin addressed the Imperial Senate, declaring multiple arrests on Christophsis and announcing the execution of the planet's Prime Minister for treason. Throughout his address, Tarkin exhibited a self-satisfied smile, his demeanor as sharp and pronounced as the Rindon sword. Upon the conclusion of his statement, a smattering of applause from the senators of Coruscant and Glee Anselm quickly grew as others joined in, and despite their personal distaste for these developments, Bail Organa and Princess Leia joined in the applause as well, aware that any sign of dissent might put Alderaan in the Empire's crosshairs. However, as he clapped, Organa fixed Tarkin with a steadfast and defiant gaze, silently communicating his disapproval. During the event, as Tarkin sipped his undiluted Alderaanian Tanrei wine, the room's atmosphere began to shift. Queen Bria's initial efforts to control the discourse by focusing on subjects Tarkin was passionate about was impressive. Yet Tarkin, ever astute, directed the conversation to put Senator Cinderon Malp on the spot, attempting to read his reaction to his words. Recognizing the potential danger of the situation, Queen Bria displayed her political acumen by executing a diversion. She feigned a drunken outburst, accusing her husband, Senator Bail Organa, and his colleague, Senator Mon Mothma, of a romantic entanglement. She even suggested that Bale had previously had an indiscretion with a Corellian woman, and Princess Leia, caught in the ruse and not entirely certain of its authenticity, was visibly shaken and emotionally disturbed, shedding tears amidst the screaming. It was a high-stakes game of deception, where Queen Bria and her allies tried to distract and mislead Tarkin, ensuring the real purpose of their gathering remained undiscovered. In the wake of the Alderaanian dinner incident, Tarkin's encounter with Princess Leia seemed rooted in ulterior motives. In the wake of the Alderaanian dinner incident, Tarkin approached Princess Leia in feigned concern as he brought up the emotional family scene, but it was a rather transparent attempt to find a crack in Leia's armor. The princess, however, maintained a diplomatic facade, emphasizing the personal nature of the family issue and her role as a bystander in it. Tarkin's compliment on her mature attitude and his suggestion that she would shine brighter than her parents felt like a veiled attempt to drive a wedge between Leia and her influential family. It was clear that Tarkin was laying the groundwork for a potential ally in Leia, hoping to mold her into a compliant figurehead for the Empire on Alderaan. He further attempted to sway her by emphasizing the importance of backing Emperor Palpatine's reign and subtly suggesting that she distance herself from her parents. Leia was well aware of these political games in the Imperial hierarchy, but she feigned gratitude, playing along while carefully treading around Tarkin's overt manipulations. And Tarkin decided he had a chance to test the theory. While he and Leia sat drinking tea, feigning this friendly conversation, he would mention the Empire moving to increase their presence on Lothal, Pacris, and Ratatak. And like he suspected, when the Empire went to go catch those rebels on Pacris, their base had been recently evacuated. Tarkin would let some days pass and get in touch with Bail Organa's office in order to speak with Leia once more. He offered his condolences, learning that Kier Damati, one of Leia's fellow apprentice legislators, had recently died in a traffic accident in Alderaan's upper atmosphere. And while secretly suspecting that his death was related to the evacuation of Pacris Major, he all but explicitly said that he was aware that she was involved with the rebellion, saying that she had great composure which Leia correctly understood to mean that she was able to look people in the eyes and lie to them, knowingly committing acts that could get her executed. This conversation was interrupted by Bale, giving his polite grin and complimenting the charming young lady, before abruptly ending the call. When Leia explained this conversation to her adoptive father, he finally let go of any pretense of keeping her out of the larger rebellion and decided to set her up with contacts and get her proper training from his top spies. Eight years after that annexation of Jellican, still in the year 3 BBY, the pair of youths Tarkin had met on that planet were accepted into the Imperial Royal Academy on Coruscant. Tarkin attended the ceremony with Darth Vader, 
and as they wondered about the future of these rising stars, Tarkin knew that most of them would be serving aboard the Death Star, which he believed was only four years away from being completed. And now in 2BBY, we find Tarkin speaking with Lorinda Price in his office, listening to reports that Lothal was secure, but that the attack on Nakara's prison might signal the start of a larger rebel threat. Vader had reported to Tarkin that he had killed Ahsoka. Tarkin knew of Vader's mission to Malachor, revealed to be the ex-Jedi Ahsoka Tano and one of the most important figures in the Rebellion. But he also knew that the rest of the Spectres needed to be destroyed. And to Price's surprise, the old Grand Moff turned to her and asked what she thought the Empire should do. She wanted the 7th Fleet to be deployed to Lothal in order to replace Constantine's fleet as the man was more of a politician than a soldier, and the man had already shown himself unable to stop the Spectre's threat. Tarkin also knew that this would help their mutual ally, the newly promoted Grand Admiral Thrawn. Grand Admiral Thrawn. Grand Admiral? The Emperor recently promoted me after my victory at Batum. Civilian casualties outnumbered the insurgents. Thrawn's introduction into the dynamic was a strategic move. Not only did his expertise and perspective bring a fresh approach to the Empire's tactics, but his promotion was a direct challenge to the established Imperial leadership, who had grown complacent in their handling of the rebels. The very essence of Thrawn's strategy was based on a deep understanding of his adversaries, often through their culture and art, giving him an almost uncanny ability to predict their next moves. This perspective was invaluable, especially in light of the Empire's often brute force approach. The choice by Price to bring Thrawn into the fold also showed her keen understanding of the political landscape that she was not complacent and knew that she would actually have to bring about success in order to rise in the ranks. Constantine and Callus' skepticism of Thrawn was reflective of the traditional Imperial mindset, which was arrogant and often underplayed the threat posed by the Rebels. But Tarkin was particularly impressed by the fact that Thrawn could deduce the Rebels' next target, the Y-Wing Starfighters, based mostly on the rescue of Hondo Onaka, and this showed the meticulous nature of his approach, setting the stage for what could prove to be the snuffing out of these embers of rebellion. Break off your attack and allow them to escape with their meager reward. Very good, Grand Admiral. In a clandestine assembly, Grand Moff Tarkin, attending via Hollow, listened intensely to the strategic insights shared by Grand Admiral Thrawn, Governor Price, and Admiral Constantine. Thrawn, known for his analytical prowess, presented the idea that the rebels of the Phoenix Squadron were advancing their strikes in a synchronized manner. Though Tarkin showed initial doubt, Thrawn was adamant, suggesting that the rebels' prior attacks were merely a prelude to a major assault on the TIE Defender factories on Lothal, a major Imperial project under Thrawn's supervision. Thrawn's intelligence network had further revealed that General Jan Dodana's renowned Masasi group was on its way to bolster the Phoenix Squadron. This cooperation between the rebel cells provided clear evidence of an emerging unified rebel alliance. Inquisitive, Tarkin questioned Thrawn on the precise location of the rebels' meetup point, and Thrawn, usually ahead in the strategic game, admitted he was still searching for their primary base. Nevertheless, Thrawn viewed the rebels' concerted efforts as an unparalleled opportunity to decimate this budding alliance entirely. Recognizing the importance of both retribution and deterrence, hoping that the public execution of this leadership would disabuse any citizen of rebellious sentiment. However, even as Thrawn's forces delivered significant blows to the rebels at the Battle of Adalon, resulting in the obliteration of their base and subsequent retreat, the elusive rebel leaders remained beyond the Empire's grasp. Tarkin both surprised and disappointed in Thrawn, who certainly had more than enough Imperial assets to bring about a victory, but in his respect for the Chiss, he had to admit that this pointed to a more troubling truth, that the Rebellion was proving to be a greater threat than any of them truly understood. After personally explaining the events to the Emperor, Thrawn was allowed to retain his command of the 7th Fleet, but he would be assigned a new mission, taking time away from the Rebel Hunt and joining Darth Vader on Batu where the pair would hunt down a mysterious disturbance in the Force. In Thrawn's absence, the task of pursuing the remnants of the Rebel forces fell to Tarkin. Collaborating closely with Commander Waldar, their combined efforts led to tracking down various scattered Rebel factions. As they tightened the noose around the Rebels, Waldar received notice of his impending new assignment, showing how the sheer scale of this galactic empire often broke the focus of certain missions, as leadership was pulled off in various directions, always hunting down new threats. In one BBY, aboard the Chimera above Lothal, Thrawn received a hollow from Tarkin. The Grand Moff informed Thrawn that his TIE Defender initiative faced potential budget cuts, as Orson Krennic was pushing to allocate all those funds towards the Death Star project. The Emperor has assured me that he supports my project. 
In my view, Director Krennic's project has been nothing but expenses and excuses for years on end. He maintained a political reservation, holding back any intention of seizing control over the project until its viability was certain. Tarkin advised Thrawn that if he wanted the TIE Defender's construction to continue, he would need to directly persuade the Emperor in a meeting Thrawn had already set up. And without hesitation, Thrawn set course for Coruscant on the Chimera. Later, aboard the Executrix, Tarkin kept a watchful eye over the progression of the Death Star's assembly. Recognizing the potential in his old friend Hurst Ramadi, Tarkin reached out and persuaded the then-retired general to join him in overseeing the Death Star's inaugural introduction to the galaxy. As the Mark I super laser was being fitted in one BBY, Director Krennic came aboard. Tarkin voiced his apprehensions regarding a defector, a cargo pilot spreading whispers about the Death Star on Jeddah, and Tarkin, growing impatient with the project never seeming to be finished, emphasized that the Emperor's patience was waning. Suggest we solve both problems simultaneously with an immediate test of the weapon. And he left Krennic with a stern reminder about the cost of failure. Subsequently, Tarkin and Ramadi stood together on the overbridge, bearing witness to the Super Laser's inaugural firing upon the ancient city of Jeddah. Their objective was dual, to eliminate the insubordinate pilot and ascertain this weapon's capabilities. While Krennic envisioned the annihilation of the entire moon, Tarkin instructed a controlled shot at Jeddah's sacred city, a demonstration of power rather than total obliteration. The weapon's discharge eradicated the city and caused catastrophic damage to its vicinity, obliterating the partisan stronghold and ending Saw Gerrera's resistance. Witnessing the weapon's sheer might, Tarkin was convinced of its nearing finality and that further postponements were inexcusable. And having always known that Krennic was merely there to act as a facade, to shield himself from any of the delays and critiques of the project, while Tarkin had always remained as the head of the program, he decided that the moment had come to step in and take direct control of this project. Following his mock apology to Krennic, Tarkin declared his intent to apprise the Emperor of the weapon's potential against the Rebel Alliance. That I will be taking control over the weapon I first spoke of years ago, effective immediately. We stand here amidst my achievement! Not yours! And Krennic's protests fell on deaf ears, as Tarkin justified his takeover with Krennic's numerous security lapses. And when Krennic whined that that pilot was decimated on Jeddah, likely killing any who might have known about the project, Tarkin only used this to make Krennic seem even more naive. The Grand Moff explaining that Krennic clearly could not be in charge of such a superweapon if he did not understand the true scale of the Rebel Alliance at this point in time. Pointing out that the pilot's origins are traced back to the Eadu facility, where Galen Urso was positioned. With simmering rage, Krennic took his leave to delve deeper into this matter. Following the Death Star's demonstration, the Rebel Cell Rogue One launched an audacious raid on the Imperial Archives located on Scarif, and were able to seize the Death Star blueprints, having learned of their whereabouts through the message from Galen Urso. This act of defiance against the Empire was due to Urso's betrayal, confirming that he was behind the earlier defection of the cargo pilot. This sudden operation, initially unsanctioned, quickly gained the backing of the Rebel fleet, which rapidly evolved to be a major confrontation, marking the beginning of the Galactic Civil War. On understanding the Rebels' primary goal from Mamradi's reports, Tarkin swiftly maneuvered the Death Star towards Scarif. With Darth Vader engaging the Rebel fleet from the Devastator, Tarkin directed the Death Star to unleash a single reactor shot on the facility, aiming to thwart the schematic's transmissions to the vessels orbiting the planet. The blast struck the pinnacle of the Citadel Tower, destroying the transmitter and poetically killing Krennic as well. The explosion's aftermath obliterated the entire installation, and he showed no remorse for the Imperial lives lost, especially not the foolish director. But as he watched the destruction spread, he was hit with a tinge of remorse as he recognized that projects like War Mantle and Stellar Sphere would experience setbacks, with the data for those projects being housed in the same vault as the Death Star blueprints. However, he remained optimistic, aware of the existence of duplicate data sets. And he was overconfident, not yet realizing that the information was successfully relayed to the Rebel fleet just in the nick of time. The blueprints eventually made their way to the Tantive IV, which managed to flee the system before Vader could halt its escape. And though moments later the Tantive IV would be captured over Tatooine, Vader and his stormtroopers would board the ship, while Princess Leia Organa, still a figurehead within the Imperial Senate for Alderaan, was detained after all these years of suspected affiliation with the Rebels. However, before her capture, the two droids R2-D2 and C-3PO were able to escape the ship with the stolen Death Star plans, landing on Tatooine where they would complete their mission of meeting Obi-Wan Kenobi. Tarkin was aware that escape pods were launched and gave strict orders that every square inch of the desert planet would be searched until these blueprints were found. 
While back in space, as the Devastator neared the Death Star, Tarkin took a moment to address the crew via Hollow. Displeased with Captain Ronadam's lax approach to Imperial protocols, he chided the captain, yet his attention was diverted when a young lieutenant, Sienna Ree, caught his eye. Tarkin's memory sparked, recalling the promising child from the Jellu Ken that he encountered years prior. Confirming Ree was indeed one of those children, a brief yet meaningful exchange ensued. Satisfied with the direction his recruitment strategies had taken, especially seeing their fruition in officers like Ree, Tarkin concluded the call, leaving an impressionable mark on those present. Ensured that the crew was on their highest alert and that the mission's importance was paramount, the capture of Princess Leia and the urgency to locate the stolen plans had brought palpable tension to every corner of the Death Star. The colossal station was not just a testament to Imperial might, but also a breeding ground for politics, power plays, and ego clashes among the top echelons of the Empire. With a higher population than some cities, and filled with some of the most career-minded, backstabbing, and advancement-sinking imps in the entire galaxy. During this crucial meeting of the Empire's highest ranking officers, differences in perspective came to the fore. The Imperial Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The last remnants of the Old Republic have been swept away. He assured them that the fear it could instill would be enough to quell any resistance. But perhaps the most intense power dynamic was the one between Mahdi and Vader. Mahdi placed absolute faith in technology and military might, and saw Vader's affinity for the Force as archaic and trivial. The Sith's swift and potent response to Mahdi's derision is not just about personal pride, but a demonstration of the Force's potency, a reminder that beyond all technology, the Force remained a truly unparalleled power. And with the subtle warning to all those who knew the Emperor's true Sith background, that no creation, even the Death Star, contained more power than their Dark Lord. Tarkin played the role of mediator, understanding that both Vader's abilities and the Death Star's firepower were integral to the Empire's strategy. With the Empire on the cusp of achieving its goal of unchallenged dominance, there was no time for infighting. Tarkin's command to Vader, although direct, allowed the cyborg his victory and saved Mahdi from further embarrassment, getting the entire room to focus their collective energies toward their shared objective, the imminent annihilation of the Rebel Alliance. While en route to Alderaan via hyperspace, Tarkin retreated to his private chamber. Immersed in various engineering reports, he felt a wave of weariness, even as he was reassured by Mahdi's updates on the Death Star's operational status. Lost in thought, Tarkin saw the imminent destruction of Alderaan as more than just coercion against Organa. It was to be a stark message to the galaxy about the consequences of defiance. Additionally, the annihilation would eliminate potential rebel allies, including the ex-Senator Bail Organa. Admiral Mahdi interrupted Tarkin's contemplation, showering him with accolades and then proposing that Tarkin was arguably the most formidable figure in the galaxy, surpassing even the Emperor. Recognizing Mahdi's ulterior motive of seeking favor, Tarkin tried not to draw too much attention to this and diplomatically excused himself. Thinking perhaps this further explained Vader's use of the Force, as these treacherous imps were looking to Tarkin, wondering if he would use this weapon against the Emperor and take control of the galaxy for himself. As they approached Alderaan, Tarkin summoned Princess Leia, and she immediately noted Tarkin's command over the station, hardly surprised. Tarkin grimly informed her of the impeding execution, but promised her a display of the Death Star's might first. Though she protested that annihilating planets would only incite further resistance, Tarkin retorted that Alderaan would be the example, since she refused to disclose the location of the rebel base. In calling on her spy training, she attempted to deceive him, claiming the base was on Dantooine, but nothing would stop this demonstration. He ordered Mahdi to fire, rationalizing that a desolate Dantooine wouldn't make a substantial demonstration, and partially motivated by a want to destroy any weakness in his crew, as he had observed Chief Gunner France's palpable relief when Leia named Dantooine, remembering Alderaan was the Gunner's birthplace, and he couldn't stand the idea that his men had a connection to anything other than the Empire. The man was not Alderaanian, but Imperial. Despite Leia's desperate pleas, Alderaan was turned into space debris. The ancient bastion of freedom and hope obliterated, and Tarkin believed that now they would have peace. Later, scouts dispatched to Dantooine under General Tag's supervision revealed Leia's lie. While Rebels had once long ago occupied Dantooine, it had been abandoned, and this only provoked Tarkin further. She lied. She lied to us. I told you she would never consciously betray the Rebellion. Terminate her. Immediately. He then gathered the gunners who showed reluctance during the firing sequence in Bay 12. Anticipating such scenarios, Tarkin had earlier instructed Admiral Mahdi to embed bio-trackers within each gunner's helmet. 
Chief Gunner Endo Frant tried to justify their hesitation, emphasizing that they still did go along with the command, that at the end Alderaan was still destroyed. Tarkin directly called Frant out on his origins, what it must have felt like to lose his homeworld, and the man retorted how would Tarkin feel if he was directed to destroy Ariadu. Tarkin looked him in the eyes and said that he would execute the order joyfully. As a stern warning to all, he then confined the hesitant gunners in an airlock and ejected them into the void of space. As Vader prepared to carry out Tarkin's directive, news reached them of a captured freighter and the remnants of Alderaan, bearing a resemblance to a ship that had escaped Tatooine. Vader, leveraging this new development, persuaded Tarkin to delay Leia's execution, suggesting that she could still be instrumental in their search. Vader's strategy was to discreetly allow the occupants of the captured freighter to escape, but not before planting a homing beacon on their vessel. This beacon would subsequently guide the Empire directly to the hidden Rebel stronghold, a tactic mirrored a previous strategy Vader employed to track down Phoenix Squadron. Then, Vader approached Targon with an intriguing piece of information. He believed one of the detainees on the recently captured ship was none other than his former mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi. The ensuing confrontation would see Kenobi become one with the Force, though neither Vader or Tarkin knew what this would mean. While the other rebels orchestrated their getaway, when Tarkin was later informed of the ship's escape, he voiced his lingering concerns about the gambit of using a homing beacon, seeing it as extremely risky. You're sure the homing beacon is secure aboard their ship? I'm taking an awful risk, Vader. This had better work. And as the Death Star aligned its super laser with the rebel base on Yavin 4, Luke Skywalker, drawing upon the Force, and with the guidance from the voice of Obi-Wan, managed to launch a precise shot of proton torpedoes into the thermal exhaust port, which due to Galen Erso's covert sabotage, triggered a chain reaction leading straight into the station's main reactor. The resulting explosion was colossal and immediate. The Death Star, a symbol of the Empire's unmatched power and Tarkin's pride, was instantly annihilated, killing Grand Moff Tarkin and nearly two million Imperial lives along with him. The unexpected defeat of the Empire's ultimate weapon was a monumental victory for the Rebel Alliance. It not only delivered a considerable blow to the Imperial morale, but also demonstrated to the galaxy that the Empire was not invincible. The hubris of Tarkin and the Empire's over-reliance on their technological terror became a cautionary tale in subsequent Imperial strategies. To make this even worse, with the liberation of Lothal occurring only a few months earlier, the Emperor had lost Grand Admiral Thrawn as well. In these few months, the Emperor's lifelong friend, and the one focused on super weapons and other large-scale projects as means of controlling the galaxy, as well as his rising Chiss genius, the one who believed in greater numbers of decentralized, flexible units like the TIE Defender, these two great Imperial assets were gone, and the rebellion was stronger than ever. In this power vacuum, we would see the rise of those like Cassio Tag, the more traditionalist and cautious approach to military strategy, perhaps the worst strategy to have at a time like this, where the rebels needed to be hit relentlessly and with the creative genius of those like Tarkin and Thrawn. Though Tag would dismiss the Death Star as Tarkin's folly, butting heads with many who still saw him as a visionary, whose dedication to the vision of a dominant, unchallengeable empire was unrivaled. Though many did feel that the Death Star was a symbol of fatal hubris, which led to Tarkin foregoing a naval escort, and with the exception of a single squadron launched by Vader, no other TIE fighter squadrons were deployed to defend the station. Trusting that the Death Star was impenetrable, and that the Rebels' pitiful bombing runs would barely scratch the surface of this moon-sized station. Darth Vader maintained a degree of respect for the late Grand Moff, viewing him as someone who truly understood the nature of power. Though at all levels of Imperial ranks, feelings about Tarkin were more varied. Officers like Aiden Versio mourned the loss of strategic leadership and did have to agree with the more cynical view of these monumental military projects. Some of the Empire's top people were on that station. Grand Moff Tarkin, Colonel Yularen, so many good men and women. The Empire would have been better off if others had made it instead of me. I'm just a TIE pilot. In the aftermath of the pivotal duel on Cloud City, Emperor Palpatine was consumed with the objective of wiping out the remnants of the Rebel fleet. With the Rebel forces significantly weakened following the Battle of Hoth, this was a prime opportunity for the Empire. Reflecting on the strategic acumen of figures like Tarkin and Thrawn, he was realizing how crucial they were, each possessing a unique ability to anticipate and counter the Rebellion's moves. Vader found himself increasingly being a military commander while delving into the esoteric teachings of the Sith, along with his personal mission to find Luke Skywalker. To help him balance all this, he turned to Elian Zara. A testament to Tarkin's legacy was the naming of the Imperial II-class Star Destroyer as Tarkin's Will. 
and it was more than just a tribute, but a declaration of intent to continue Tarkin's ruthless pursuit of ever-improving Imperial projects. But it wasn't long before the final catastrophic blow at the Battle of Endor, where the second Death Star was destroyed, with the battle marking the bodily death of the Emperor and Vader. In a shift of control in the galaxy, the once great galaxy-spanning empire was now fractured into dozens of bickering imps, scrambling to retain power in a loose force that was called the Imperial Remnant. And in just a year, these fragmented forces would face their ultimate defeat at the hands of the New Republic, during the decisive Battle of Jakku. In the subsequent years, as the galaxy grappled with its own turbulent past, the memoir Tarkin had been writing over his lifetime surfaced. This piece provided a rare insight into the mind of one of the Empire's most formidable figures, showcasing both his brilliance and the chilling determination that defined the era of the Empire. Decades after Tarkin's death, his legacy persisted in various ways, some overt and others more subtle, marking the truly profound impact he left on the galaxy. During Grand Admiral Ray Sloan's investigation of the Emperor's Super Star Destroyer Eclipse's disappearance just before the Battle of Jakku, she came across an image crystal. The crystal displayed an old image of Emperor Palpatine alongside several distinguished Imperial officers, among them the unmistakable visage of Tarkin. Those two ambitious youths felt ostracized from the oligarchs of the Core Worlds, who had taken the highest ranks of power and changed the course of trillions of lives. Leia Organa's encounter with Ren Rivendai, a notorious Kajain San Nikto crime lord, brought forth his own memories of Tarkin, with Ren Rivendai's pursuits of respectability masked behind an intellectual veneer, reminding her a lot of the Grand Moth. Even the First Order, who rose from the ashes of the Empire, held Tarkin in deep reverence. The First Order integrated Tarkin's name into their rank insignia, specifically the armband for majors, an enduring tribute to the Grand Maw. This adulation extended to their military as well, with a squadron of Thai FO fighters on Starkiller base aptly named Tarkin's Revenge. These fighters faced off against the forces of Leia's resistance in a desperate bid to defend their own superweapon. Which was itself, of course, just another example of how the Tarkin Doctrine had become something of a holy grail or a philosopher's stone for dictators. And despite the decades that had passed since the traumatic destruction of Alderaan, the memory remained raw for Leia. As she sought the Mon Calamari's aid against the burgeoning First Order, she recalled the catastrophic moment when Tarkin, with cold precision, vaporized her home world. And thus, long after his death, Tarkin's actions would be the greatest fuel for the Resistance. From the haunting memories of the attacks on Jeddah and Alderaan, Tarkin was able to unite the galaxy through fear, just in the opposite way he had hoped. Countless systems turned this fear into bravery, vowing to never let the galaxy come under the control of the Emperor again. And so that concludes the complete life of Grand Moff Will of Tarkin. Please hit that like button, it's the best way to help me out. Share the video, subscribe to see more, and check out these other videos, I'm sure you'll like them. But most important of all, remember, fear can unite, just not in the ways evil hopes. And the Force will be with you, always.